Oh, hello, everybody. I joined you a few minutes before our guests. Um, yes, I'm going to be talking to Ian and Dominic Higgins, who run a film company called Pixel Revolution. Um, they've released a film today. If you look um, probably at the next posting on my Facebook, or Dogs Today's Facebook, or indeed my own Facebook, you'll see a link to YouTube and you can watch The Wolf. Um, oh, I've got the name wrong. A Wolf. It's got wolves and men in it. Ah. Seriously, my memory is not what it was. A wolf. A wolf and men. It's the story of how wolves and men got together anyway, but you'll, you'll find it. Dear me. I need auto, auto, an auto cue. Now, have we got them here yet? No, I'm still not there yet. Can you all hear me all right? Um, let me have a look, see who um, who's already here. Oh, I'm not sure that we are live yet. Are we live? Oh, 22 of you are looking. So can you tell me where you are in the world? That would be really helpful. There's a, quite a long time delay on this at the moment. Mm. Anyway, a shout out to all 24 of you who have now joined us. Um, any more people? Um, can anyone hear me to say, do say hello, just so I know you're there. And I'm not even sure if my volume's on. Is my volume on? Yes, my volume's on. Um, I'm going to go back and have a look, see if uh, they're in the waiting room yet. I don't think they are. No, they're not yet. Okay. Let me just sneakily tell you what their next film project is. Some of you may already know of the story of Fleur, F-L-E-U-R, um, a gorgeous dog that was horribly treated in Romania um, and was seen on Facebook by lots of people who um, didn't, didn't, oh, here we go, I've got a knock on the door, I'm gonna let them in. Right, so do give them a warm round of applause. <laughs> Hello, we're already live. Hello, <laughs> we're back again. We had people from um, all over the world saying hello. I don't know if you saw, but um, we're not get, we're not going to be able to talk to them direct because of the twenty second delay. But uh, we've we had people from uh, Texas, India, and Iran uh, who already said hello. So that's it's nice to know. Right, I'm. I, I don't know if you've managed to catch any of my earlier podcasts. Uh, um, if you had, you'd probably um, that would have put you off because they do tend to go on for rather a long time. It's but just like a conversation, isn't it? It is. It's just a chat. We just ignore the fact that. I don't, let me see how many people are watching. Oh, only fifty-four at the moment. It's it's still it's growing. Yes. It's growing. So, um, if you had, you'd probably. Oh, um, we've got now off, horrible echo. Go on, now, let me um, silence that. Gosh, that was very unprofessional, wasn't it? That was the future talking, or was it the past? I'm not sure. Okay, so your twins is that correct? To right. start with the obvious, which one's which? Sorry, I'm really uh, Dominic. Um, Dominic. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, and who's the older of the two? I, I am by about three three minutes. And do you, do you pull that all the time and say uh, older it doesn't, work. it doesn't usually work. No, it's, it's worth a try though, isn't it? And where are you from? I, 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 I'm not Birmingham. Sure. Sorry. Just outside Birmingham. Birmingham. All oh, right. I'm from Liverpool, so we probably have to have a fight later. <laughs> But um, okay, and I saw from your resume that you um, did. You both go to the same university. Do you both went to Bournemouth uh, Art College? Yeah, Bournemouth Art College. Uh -huh. And what course did you do? It was three uh, three D design. Um, originally, we intended to um, study special makeup effects. And, and right. Um, uh, well, obviously, with uh, an aim to go into film production. Um, but um, while we were there. We did a um, photography course, and suddenly realised that's where our first, that's where our real passion was to be photography and, and telling stories. Oh, and how long ago uh, was that? Uh, oh God, it's going back to nineties, yeah, ninety one, ninety two. Yeah, it's going back a while. But I, I think. Cool. Oh, you're very special. Making it. Uh, I, I think. What, 
And I said, I'll be back. You're back. I'll be okay. <laughs> and I think it was, with the special effects, it was the illusion of filmmaking that we actually was really fascinated by. And you know, the film itself is it's an illusion. It's yeah. like a magic trick. I think that's why we originally thought special makeup effects, but it's changing people's faces, it's doing all this um, illusion. Mm -hmm. um, thing. And I think when we were playing with the cameras, doing photography, we realised we actually wanted to be behind the camera, framing shots, telling stories. Wow. And how how long did it take you to um, to get going? Because there's a lot of people have these dreams. Very few actually make it into reality. So how did you, how where did your struggle start? And were you, were you spotted? How did it, how did you get your breaks? Right. Uh, actually, it's strange set of circumstances. Um, left college, um, did um, all sorts of jobs, working in bars, um, selling windows. Um, but all the time we were writing scripts. Yeah. Uh, and um, just by that chance, um, I went to an interview uh, at a local bar. Mm -hmm. and the guy who owned the bar, who was interviewing me, happened to be a BBC set designer. And he knew some of the teachers I'd worked with uh, at college. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we just started chatting. And the next minute he said, do you fancy having some work experience on, on, on a BBC set? Uh, so I said, um, you haven't got the job, but you can come down and, and have a, some experience on a BBC set. So I said, absolutely, yeah. It's not been in the last room. So um, oh. he took an interest in our script writing process and sort of helped develop um, gave us yeah, he gave us advice and pointed our scripts, in, uh, put our scripts in, in the right hands so people could come back uh, with critical feedback. Yes. Well, by any chance, this would be really spooky if it was. Was his name Patrick Doherty? No, Nigel James. Oh, it was Patrick's one of my Facebook friends. There's a little shout out to Patrick. But I taught Matthew how to do pie charts when he was a little boy. And he's now the set designer for Strictly and Who Wants to Be a Millionaire and all the big, big ones. His name's always at the bottom and he always wins something. And I would say if he hadn't have, if I hadn't have taught him pie charts, there you go. he'd be Absolutely. nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're incredibly connected um everybody in the in the industry aren't there and then there's lots of us outside looking in who will go oh that looks really interesting and once they're in they're all oh it's just that's just a job <laughs> yeah, right. I, I think today uh because of technology i think it's a much more level playing field uh, i mean um 20 years ago uh it was cost, the films that we, we've been producing they've cost 10 times the amount of budgets that we had to work with yeah uh, Make a phone, uh, a film on an iPhone today, mm -hmm. yeah. and a lot of filmmakers are professional directors who work in Hollywood are using iPhones yeah. to make movies. So it's te technology. I think it's completely changed. Level the playing it's, it's changed the industry, uh, and there's a lot more independent filmmakers that are coming up that wouldn't have had that chance a few years ago. And I guess Netflix and Amazon has changed everything too. Um, uh, the, the, but I think everyone thought film was going to die, but it actually has picked up again, yeah. wasn't it? It's strange. It's all been sound came out. Yeah. And colour. When colour came out, it was all it's really yeah, it's, it's 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 not real film, it's it's not true film, it's not black and white. Yeah. It's sound. Yeah, sound came out as the same as a fear. Well, they thought sound was a fad. When sound came out, it was just a fad, like three D was in the fifties and sixties, you know. <laughs> film evolves yeah. and this is the next stage in the evolution of film. And uh, it's it's very exciting to see the projects that you've chosen to do. Um, and is it a case, because um, I, I'm going to admit here, I'm a bit of a geek. I, I'm, 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 I'm a dog and film geek. Um, <laughs> well, I, 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 I always think in film um, for no, and I've got no um, background in it, but when I was, I've been editing dogs today for 30 years. So in that time, I've met a few stories and I've gone, that's a movie. And I, in the early days, I went, that's a movie. And then I went and said, said told loads of people, said, please make this movie. And uh, it took years of anyone to, to actually come up with um, a book, then a film. And I'd talk to the producers and I'd say, oh, I see, I can see every frame. And then he'd give someone else the job to write the script. And I'd go, oh, <laughs> I'm really sad now. Um, and 
I then went off to the Met Film School to do screenwriting just for um, just so that next time I had that conversation with the producer, I could say, oh, actually, here's one I've written that's, yeah. But everybody thinks they can write yeah. films, don't they? Because that's it. We've all got an opinion on it because we all watch film. Yeah. yeah. But what you've dis discovered, which is what I've discovered, which other people discover, is that films with dogs that don't get shot are actually really, really popular. I think John Wick's, for example, the whole trilogy, if it wasn't for the dogs, it would be, no, no, it's just the people watching around the shooting for the dogs. I know the shooting's very important, but yeah. I think as well, uh, what we found out, uh, from our personal experience as well, um, listen to other people, I think you've got to have a real dog in a story. Um, look, the new um, Call of the Wild with Harrison Ford. Oh, the yeah. Completely sneaky yeah. dog in there, which is really a man in a green screen costume. And I, I just, I, they don't have a caption. I think they miss something when you try to use CG to, to recapture the essence of a dog. I don't think it comes yeah. through. It does not come through. Mm. You need to have a real dog. Weirdly, I think this came up in the last podcast I did two weeks ago with Colin Skeeping, who was a stuntman. And he's a friend of Harrison Ford, and Harrison Ford is a dog person. So he would have been really annoyed yeah. that they didn't use a real dog um, because, you know, he knows what – he loves them, and he's, you know, he's dog mad. So, um, yeah, that's, I, why is it – do you think it's that because people have such busy lives in the film industry and the television industry, that very often the commissioners um, actually don't have a dog and don't understand – Oh, yeah. Yeah. But I think a large part of it is it's, there's a lot of fear on set working with animals today. Yeah. Uh, Warhorse came under a lot of uh, scrutiny working uh -huh. with poetry uh, on set. And uh, A Dog's Purpose, mm -hmm. I think it was. Oh, yeah. Oh, Dog's Purpose. Oh. Uh, we've seen when the dog uh, almost drains. That was uh, bad. The real dog on set did. But, uh, I, I think for us, uh, it's, we'd rather have longer shooting days. Yeah. Uh, at more pace-saving day uh, to make sure the dog is comfortable and have somebody who's experienced looking after them. Not just working with children on set, but a full-time handler on set who's there to Definitely. look after them. Definitely. Well, weirdly, another of my Facebook friends who may or may not be watching is Charlotte Wilde, who um, runs one of the biggest agencies for the dogs and the cats that you see on film. And quite a number of the people who are my Facebook friends have the dogs and the cats that you see on all the films. Um, so they're all really keen on some standards, really, that that proper people are used on set. And weirdly, I had a strange, strange conversation with the producers of, um, oh, the cat movie. What was um, Street Cat Named Bob? Yes. Yeah. And it was their first big film. And um, I followed the story for a long time because James... We made his cat an honorary dog and put him on the front cover. And right when they were beginning to pull the script together, I said, you really should start booking the cats now because it'll take that long to train that many cats. And they said, no, no, it'll be fine. Don't worry. And I said, I can put you in touch with someone who, who's got loads of cats that could do this job because it's a really difficult job. And they went, no, no, we've already got that organised. And the, the, they, they had a chat. Um, somebody brought them over from Canada, which was, must have come with huge, um, yeah, loads of experience. But being a cat in central London when you're trying to film and you're having to stand on a, an, an actor's shoulders, well, they all ran away and they had nobody to, to film. The only cat that would do it was Bob himself. So Bob acted in his own movie. And if he hadn't, there would have been no movie. I mean, it's... You can't tell a cat what to do. No, no, and, and it would take years to train a cat to um, that standard. And um, oh, so they were very, very lucky because that meant that Bob was um, on set every day, and also Bob's owner, who was James, uh, that was there putting the cat on the actor's shoulders, watching himself in a movie, which was yeah, really yeah. surreal. Oh, yeah. um, but um, but yeah, well, there you go. But yeah, it, it, it's it's good to use the people who've spent years getting the animals used to sets because 
a stressed out dog or cat will ruin your production. I'm, I'm amazed they got insurance to do the street cat only Bob because you've only, you've only got one cat to do everything. It's just, um, well, they were very lucky. They were very lucky. It was such an exceptional cat. Sadly, well, now departed. I know. We saw an interview with, with James uh, a couple of years ago, and the interview asked him, about, "You know, you've got to face the inevitable one day." Uh, you, just, you can see him breaking up on set, and I thought, "What an insensitive question to, to oh, ask!" Oh, it's doesn't it? He's back on the shoulder, and I just thought, "You know, you, oh. you just look how close that that fine But I, I think that brings us to the point why we made what we made of wolves and men, and Fleur, why we're developing Fleur. A lot of people don't understand. The how emotionally no. connected humans and animals can become in a relation. Uh, you know, our own parents, you know, they, they like dogs and cats, but they can't understand. You know, when we had a dog, we were kids and we died, we were heartbroken. They just couldn't understand it. You can get another dog, you can, you know, have a, you know, mm-hmm. a day, day to yourself and then, you know, you're, you're okay, but don't realize you're heartbroken. No, yeah. I, it, it, it's, it, well, it's one of my bugbears is that our laws reflect. Um, a time when dogs were chattel, when they were things, when they were there to help us work and they had a financial value because they were living outside and maybe they were rounding up sheep for us. And the the law never moved on. And now they're part of our family. And the relationship we have with them is so strong that if someone steals our dog, it's not the same as stealing something of the same financial value. They're irreplaceable. And yeah. and it, it's it is as if half the world knows and half the world doesn't know. Yeah. And um it, it and, and eventually they'll all understand, but it is some people have never had a dog or a cat that means something in their lives. Um when you look at the films like Marley and Lee, they take it for granted that it's it's almost it's made for an exclusively dog loving audience. Now they, they already get it. We yeah. want to make a film that will tell the other. 50% of the world, over, at least open their eyes to understanding what it is that makes dogs or cats, whatever animal the film's about, what makes them special. Yeah. Not, you know, we don't want to do, you know, we don't want to just make a film that's just dog lovers are going to go, oh, I want to watch that because it's got a dog in it. We want to watch a film people watch to go away and understand, at least now we understand the relationship. With, I think Marley and Me was a surprise big hit, wasn't it? Which is, Odd. I, I, I'm, this shows how old I am. I was talking to the chap who wrote Marley and Me, the book, and he was just saying that it was a bit like the cat story, that being on set, seeing Jennifer Aniston playing his real wife. Um, <laughs> he, he found that sort of really quite spooky. And he'd been writing these columns for a newspaper for ages. And it was it was a real surprise to him that, you know, all of a sudden he was like, you know, well, it would have changed his life, that movie. I mean, gosh, I mean, how much... And the book itself would have made, made a huge amount of money. But it really was just... I, w- I went to a press sp- screening of it in Leicester Square, um, and everyone else in the audience was a proper journalist. I was the only dog journalist there. <laughs> so I was doing it for... Probably the only dog journalist. Oh, yeah, no, no. I, 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 I don't consider myself a real journalist. I'm a dog journalist, which is a very small niche. But... Um, other like Radio Four and people like that always like to send me to do um, review doggy films because I think it's funny. Or, or, but recently I was sent to view, review Cats, the movie, <laughs> which yes. I thought was cruel. I mean, it was a horrible film, but um, it, it was it was interesting that I was reviewing it. But yeah, I was in um, Leicester Square watching Marley and Me, and I was sort of going, I know what's coming. I mean, this dog is going to die, and we're all going to cry. But all the people around me, it was a tremendous surprise. And they were all sobbing. These were all the journalists that normally are going, oh, I've seen that before. You know, it was they were really moved and they were surprised. And I I think that seems to be always the case that these movies that are true um suddenly hit people. And I don't think you necessarily had to be a dog lover to to cry at Marley and me. I think that a lot of people, I think um, some statistics show that eighty percent of people actively like dogs, even if they don't have one. So yeah. you, you're only dealing with twenty percent of people who are probably scared of dogs yeah. or, or have had a bad experience. Yes. 
but they can still fall in love with the character you portray. Um, and really, my and me, when you start taking it apart, it's a very, very simple film, isn't it? I mean, very simple. Yeah. I mean, you think, who got that script and went, that's going to make money? Yeah. Um, and you really want to find him and then send your scripts, don't you? <laughs> yes. Oh, dear. So have you got agents now? Do you have people who... who because that's hard getting that bit, isn't it? Oh, yeah. we've got we've got um, a super, superstar producer, uh, Nigel oh. David, who's very well connected. Um, but he's he just he makes things happen. Yeah. You so know, how he, did how did you meet him? What was what was the big break there? He reached out to us. Um, he dropped us an email about ten almost ten years ago now. Because um, mm-hmm. so he he's local, he's Birmingham based. Right. He goes want to meet for a coffee and a chat. Uh, and we did. We spent about three hours just talking about ideas for films that we had, um, and we just clicked. And uh, within a couple of months, he was working on uh, one of our films, getting everything sorted for us, organising stuff. And, um, it just took off from there, and we've worked for about almost ten years. Uh, to be honest. Oh, I think the secret is to surround yourself with a good team. Yeah. So yeah. that's uh, you know a creative team, a good creative team who all want to tell the same story. So it doesn't just become our passion project. It's their passion yeah. project as well, which we were really lucky with, and particularly with the Blur story, that uh, so many of the crew love dogs. So, you know, it's going to be a great environment you know, mm-hmm. to, to work with, uh, you know, bring to bring the dog on set because everyone's going to be spoiling the dogs. Oh. Uh, that, that, and, and you've met Fleur, haven't you, already? So, you you know, yeah. Fleur is, is, is an extraordinary little dog because mm-hmm. a lot smaller than you think she's going to be. Yeah, very, very slight, very slight yeah. dog. And, and almost iridescent, the, the white is pure white, really sort of like a, a little a shining angel. You know, you sort of, things bounce off her. Yeah. And if you take her in anywhere, even if people don't know the story, people are attracted to her. Which yeah, something about her. It, yeah, well, something. I think there's a sadness about Beckler as well, though. Uh, yes. I picked up her as a there is a, a, a deep sadness about her, I suppose. Uh, yes. She's been yeah, reflecting her, her life experience. Um, but what's incredible is that she's so gentle yeah she's so good with people you know considering that that the source of her pain has been humans she's so relaxed and so gentle and so so intuitive with with humans it's just remarkable it it is amazing the trust there that after how badly Mm. humans let her down for her to to trust again and and just to be she's just so dainty as well i mean she's sort of Considering all that she's been through, she doesn't look like a dog that nearly died. I mean, she looks she looks so amazing. And yeah, it's very ladylike, isn't she? Yeah, lady. Yeah. 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 yeah, she she has got an elegance, got a very graceful yeah. quality to her. Which again, uh, she's a street dog. It's going to be hard, hard casting. Yeah. It's going to be hard casting yeah. Fleur really because she has to have she has to have the essence of Fleur. Oh, yeah. so Fleur's not going to play herself. No, well, because I think we need a younger dog. Uh, just mm. try to so I think we can. We did talk about Fleur, but the one concern we've yeah. got is uh, how traumatic it would be for Fleur to uh, relive some of those when she put into cages and you know, the, the scenes in the Hallett. Yes. Uh, it's going to be quite uh, traumatizing. Yeah. And so we don't really want to have to make it uncomfortable for Fleur. For Fleur so it could be um, really kinder. To, to use a, a dog that's specially trained for those things. Uh, so what, what sort of, because I, I was wondering, because I've, I've seen that some of your films are animation, some of them are a mixture of acting and animation, and some of them uh, seem to be much more traditional. So what 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 what, what, what flavour are you going to make the Fleur film? It, it's always hard to say, more until we've written a script. Uh, some of it's down to budget, uh, animation sometimes, or you know, a blend of animation is is a budget thing. It makes it easy, especially if you're doing the atomic bombing of Nagasaki. Yes. If you can blend in animation rather than you know getting the Hollywood style big special effects in yes. But I, I think with Flo, we'd like to mix animation in there somehow. So it's a it's a weave of live action. Yeah. But with I think with animation, animation you can show things without being over graphic because mm-hmm. it can be very stylized. Yes. You know, take the film. Uh, so uh, because we want this to be a film that anyone can watch. Uh, so we don't want it to be very um, too traumatizing you know, for younger yes. women. Using uh, animation is, is a, a way we can explore 
certain areas of the story that are quite dark, make it watch, yeah, but make it more viewable, more cheap. So yeah, that would be we will know once the script's written how hey, hey, we want to take it, but uh, sort of ideas I've been thinking about at the moment. So how did you, let's, let's go back a, a few steps, right? So did you decide, I mean, let, you've, you, what, what's been your most successful film so far? So let, let's, let's go back to your, um, what led you to Fleur? 13 Days probably been the most successful that we've done, which was our first feature. Um, that, it's quite um, quite successful, wasn't it? Um, I mean, we, that wasn't made by our company. Though. We, we were commissioned to, yeah. to work as, um, as the creatives on it, really. Um, but that's been our most successful one, and that, that opened a lot of doors for us um, once that film was made. It was shown at Cannes, uh, so that got a lot of. Um, How exciting! Did you go? Did you go to Cannes? Uh, we we were locked away uh, finishing the film off while the producers swanned off to. Uh, Ah. Few in and in, um, enjoyed the red carpet camp, but um, that's fine. We'd rather be yeah, working away yeah. uh, rather than on, on the red carpet. Um, so it seems to us, but uh, that's been that uh, did a lot of good for us. That film did, mm. uh, it also boosted our confidence to carry on making films, yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it's to, to tell people what 13th Day is because I'd never heard of this. Um, phenomena. Um, yes, it seems to be something that lots of people know about. Is it the most modern miracle that that they reckon there's been? So there's, it's a true story of three children that suddenly experience something. They can't, I mean, whether or not you believe or not believe, they experience something and they kept to their story even they got them into terrible trouble. You should don't say this. I've only read the I haven't well, seen the film yet. You've recapped it really. It was uh, three children. I mean, they showed at Incredible College because uh, they were threatened with death because uh, it was a, a very uh, communist government that was in place in Portugal at that time. It's 1917, so war was raging. A lot of uh, families had their sons and fathers off at war. So uh, it was a country that was really looking for something. They were looking for an answer and you know, a, a reason why this was happening. But yeah. the government was very anti-religion. So it was closing the churches down. It was uh, stopping any sermons being spread around the country. Uh, and then just one day in May, these three children came running home uh, to one of their parents and said that they had seen a vision of a lady floating above a oak bush uh, on, on one of their fields. And it was the Blessed Mary, uh, Virgin Mary. And that caused a whole uh, heap of trouble for the kids. You know, the, the press congregated on, on, on Fasana, uh, and the for the uh, government was, I think we can't let this story get out. We can't uh, have people think, believing in fairy stories and things like that. So therefore, it was a very dangerous um, thing that the kids were doing. So yeah, the kids were arrested, threatened with, with, with uh, torture and, and eventually death. Um, unless they recanted and, and said that they had made it up, they, just, they wouldn't. They just stuck to their story and they said, no, we would rather die than say we were lying. Uh, so it's, but it ends up being a very faithful family story. And I, I think um, not faithless in a religious way, but the communities came together behind the children and mm -hmm. the families really got behind them. So it, it has ultimately has a very uplifting mm -hmm. ending to the story. And obviously the, there was a big miracle that was witnessed by 70,000 people um, on October 13th, 1917, which we can't explain today. Uh, yet something definitely happened at Fatima, so whether you're a believer or not, um, yeah. there is something that definitely happened on that day uh, in Fatima, 1917. Wow. And that was an amazing project to, to, to have land in your, in your hands. Yeah. yeah. We had a private investor, and yeah, he, uh, he just allowed us to really go where we wanted with the scripts, yeah. uh, work with the cast. Well, originally, it was, it was a short film; it was a ten-minute film. And yeah. when we searched it, we uh, had a meeting with him. We said, "Look, um, this is a feature film. It, it doesn't do justice ten minutes uh, mm -hmm. to tell the story." And and we were really lucky that he said, "Okay, okay, let's do it." Mm -hmm. um, um, he, he just gave us so much freedom to do the film. And I haven't said that. I mean, we always screen, test screen our films. Yeah. To get people. Um, so in the final film is what other people, you know, it's other people's inputs in the final film. It's not just 
Yeah, I think you've got to be very egotistical to sit there and think, oh, I, I, can, I can make a perfect movie. You can't, you know. And, and when you get too close to the story, sometimes yeah. you don't realize that some people don't understand you know, things that make sense. So, right. yeah, it was, it was a great experience. Wow. But I, I've seen um, the preview of it and um what what year did you make this in was it 2006 uh, 2009 it came out yeah because it, it's is it black and white all the way until the miracle and then color yeah now yeah, that, every, time that's every time we see something supernatural yeah. it's cut in color because yeah. it was our whole idea that so much is hidden from the world that we don't see and we yeah. tend to see black and white and really different. It's a lot more that you just don't see, unless you've got an open mind or an open heart. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of things are hidden from us. Wow, so a magical film because I've, I've seen it, it gets shown all over the states, particularly, um, yeah. and they have viewings. And it, there aren't many people making films that make people happy. Mm. And, and like, I remember, I can remember films that where mm. the audience went out uplifted like the king's speech is one where i watched that in the first day it was out and and it was a normal screening and everyone clapped at the end and i thought gosh that's that, that doesn't happen very often no, very no, often it. people are going home going mm, that's a bit depressing yeah, yeah. <laughs> i don't know why that is it just seems that everybody seems obsessed with making gritty urban um, realistic you don't want always wants to go to the cinema to escape into real life. You want to go to the cinema to escape yeah. real life. You know, you want to. Uh, you, I think the forties and thirties and fifties uh, era of filmic they had it so right. You know, obviously there was a war going on in the forties. You yeah. went to the, the, the cinema. You watched something like Gone with the Wind. I mean, the uh, 19, uh, 1939 is usually classed as the greatest film uh, uh, history. Um, yeah, sorry, greatest year mm -hmm. filmmaking. 1939, the year of war broke out in Europe. You've got Wizard of Oz, you've got all this amazing, a gone of the wind. You know, you've got absolutely amazing. I think they understood then that film was something that people wanted to be, they wanted to be transported away to. Yes. A place that made them feel good. And it was a break from the reality of life. And I think we need that now more than ever. Definitely. We need to transport it to somewhere that's magical, that makes you feel good. Yeah. That was, you know. And also, I think it, with us going through a pandemic, the last thing we want is disaster movies. We want things that show that, you know, miracles can happen, things can turn out okay, and everything will be all right. We might not actually think we want that, but I think we need it. Yeah, it's exactly need it. yeah. and in lockdown, dogs became so central to so many people. I mean, people went nuts. I think mean, you probably picked up on that, that... Um, after impulse purchasing the toilet rolls, they were impulse purchasing the Andrex puppies, and the people were gazumping each other, and just prices just went crazy. And um, people wanted to buy happiness; they wanted to buy a puppy. Um, and it was oh, loads of people got ripped off. People didn't get the dogs they thought; they just got just lost their money. Um, but it, I think it did remind everybody the importance of family and the importance of the home and and that people, I don't think, really want to go back to what was before. I think people who have found they can work from home with their dog actually yeah. are going, I don't really want to go and leave the dog anymore because yeah. they don't want to pay someone to look after the dog. They want to be the one looking after the dog because the dogs have reminded us what's important in life. Um, they've they they live in the moment. They yeah. uh, you know they don't think oh what will happen next week. They they're just delighted that every day you're so surprising that you provide them with food and yeah. you might go for a walk. And it's always hugely exciting, even if it's exactly the same thing. Yeah. And in lockdown, um, we all sort of probably bickered with the people we lived with because they didn't maybe empty the dishwasher as often as they should have done. But we don't expect that of our dogs. We we have no expectation of them. Um, doing anything and the, they also don't grow up and grow away so I think um, that, that some people say dogs are surrogate children but no because children get older and then they go away <laughs> dogs never you have with a dog than you do with another human being it's a, a lot of people do think that they think oh, it's just a child substitute or you know whatever it's a different kind of relationship it's a different kind of friendship 
And that's what people don't understand. And so, you know, but still... every now and again, someone says something about it. And it was James Serple, who's a, an academic, and he said that um, the love of dogs isn't childish. The dog allows us to remember the child within us so we can play again and we can live in the moment and have fun. And um, that even like, you know, a judge, um, actually one of my Facebook friends who I interviewed a few podcasts ago is a QC. He's soppy as anything about his dog, Lawrence. And he just loves his dog to pieces. He gets a complete sop about it. And the next minute he's a criminal barrister and, uh, you know, people are terrified of him. But the dog brings that out of us here. The innocent bit, the jolly bit, the, the hopeful bit. And um, and I'm I'm just delighted that you're of that opinion too because I think you've got a life's work ahead of you of doing films about dogs. Um, yeah. I don't know whether you know you don't, you want to be typecast into. We've got so many dogs. We've got so many dogs going. We, we, it took us uh, for the last five or six years. We've been dragging Nigel around different books. Then oh look, this is a great story. You know, Nigel knows that we've been. We've had this in us for years now, the dog movie. Yeah. So he's, he's glad that we're going to get out of our system at least for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, well, we've, got, the only one. we've got a notebook full of other stories. But most of them are historical. And it was, I read an article on, on the street dogs in Romania. Mm -hmm. it, it was reading an article. I realised there's a contemporary story that we need to tell. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's more important, really, because it's happening right now. And it's not just in Romania, but in all other countries. As yeah. well, and if we can just say, look, well, you know, this is going on, it's, you know, it's terrible and it needs to stop. But film has got that emotional punch, you know, a documentary can, can shock you, yes, it's a movie of a way a film can. Uh, so I, I, I think film is the medium we want to use to say to, to wake people up and say, look, well, this is going on, change because some I can't imagine, but some people watching may not know the Fleur story, so let's um. Let's do a quick recap, because in a way, there's a theme here, because um, the problem in Romania um, is government-sponsored dog genocide, really. So it, it is a political thing to clean up the streets, and there's a bounty put on the head of the dogs, um, so that people are throwing dogs into shelters. Because people say, oh, you've, there's dog problems in this country. We shouldn't be bothering ourselves with dogs overseas. But dogs don't understand borders and dogs don't understand politics. And, you know, really that's silly, isn't it? Why, why we shouldn't care about people and dogs in other countries. I mean, there shouldn't be no, no nobody should be that black and white about it. But mm -hmm. Romania is the worst in the world. Um, and I, it's got more dogs than anywhere else in the world per head of population. Well, but uh, people, um, the people who try to help them are also victimised. Yeah. Uh, lots of people who go into the shelters and try to rescue these dogs are bullied, uh, they're threatened, some of them are uh, physically assaulted. So it's, it's not just, it's also uh, aimed towards those who are trying to help the dogs. So it's such a serious situation uh, in, in Romania, Bucharest um, particularly. And that, that's what really drew us to, to want to tell the story. And, and Fleur uh, is the perfect uh, story to get us in, yes. in, into that world, to explore that world. Because I think that's the thing, is that it is such a huge problem that a lot of people don't want to even think about it because um, it's just too, too vile. Mm. But I found that when you saw one face looking out of Facebook at you, which was little Fleur, you suddenly went, well, I know logically we can't save every dog in the world, but you can save that one yes. and you can make the world of difference to that dog. Yeah. And now you've seen that dog. Now you've looked into its eyes. You can't look away. Yeah. You, and that's what your film hopefully will do is re make people imagine it from the dog's perspective. Because, um, I mean, what they do, and you've probably you know spoiler alert for your film but the the seven day rule where that when they round up the strays um they say it's not economic to feed them um in the seven days before they're killed and so if no one claims them then they're going to put them to sleep so what's the point of feeding them so they don't get food or water and they're yeah. squashed together so you've got it's it's just 
Uh, you know, you couldn't make it up. It's vile. What a right. horrible thing to do. That's battery process. You know, the, the more dogs that they get in, the more they, they, there's even stories of them uh, re-releasing dogs onto the streets just so they can, oh, so they can recatch they the bounty on the head. So it, wow. it's just they're not concerned about feeding the dog. The dog's just uh, a money ticket. And once yeah. they've got the, the, the paycheck, then uh, the dog goes out or, or the dog is curled. And then another dog falls. It's, it's, it's just um, like a horrible, ugly yeah. battery. Like Each death is is um, has got a bounty on it, and they also get money for spaying, yeah, and yeah. that means that in our country, and I mean, I, my dog Betty had a um, a lap a lapros a keyhole surgery spay, which involved only a tiny bit of super glue, no, no so simple, so um, perfect. Whereas poor old Fleur and a few others have been so badly butchered. Mm. Um, and sewn up with string, some of them. And some of the dogs are being killed by injecting with paint because it's cheaper than the drugs. Now, you've got to put a bit of that in there. Even though it's a vile, it does give an idea of... I think people don't need to understand the extent of the horrors. But like I say, we've got to do it, as filmmakers, we've got to do it in a way that's palatable. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but without dimming from what's, you know, what's happening. We don't want to people think they just get thrown in a cage. They don't. And you know, there's ex excrements all over those cages. They're just never there. They're, they're like, it's like a leather bag. You just throw it into a, a corner and, you know, just leave it. You know, a dog is in it. It's a thing. Yeah. You know, and and they, they often fight amongst themselves because they're starving. Yeah. And it, 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 it's the equivalent. It, yeah. They're, they're, they're innocence. They're gentle and they're, the street dogs in Romania to survive have, have had to be very, very friendly to the humans and good at begging. Uh, so they've got generations of street smart and and and, and they're, they're evolved. They're, they're really gorgeous, a lot of them as well, because people tended to feed the ones that the pretty ones. I mean, that's that's we we encourage them. When I say we, I mean the human race. Um, they, 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 you know, they're not out there catching their their dinner. They're they're getting fed by some people who love them, and then another lot are uh, rounding them up and killing them. And it's just like, oh come on, people, you know, stop it. And and the pressure has been to to try and get the government to change the rules and embarrass them. But um, it, are you likely to film in Romania? I, I would have thought you'd be... We would like to, yeah. I mean, obviously, depending on the COVID situation. <laughs> uh, but we, do, we, get, we at least want to get over there to do some research, to meet the people that were actually involved. Like we've met Andy, uh, Andrew and Wendy and Fleur. We'd like to meet the people from Romania, you know, the real people, talk to them, get a feel for where they came from and what motivated them. And also just to walk the streets that Fleur would have walked. It, you know, it's so important for us to, to capture that world. Uh, mm -hmm. So we want to get over there to do some research, but we'd like to film at least part of the there as well. So you've got that. Yes. You, you, you might have trouble um, because there's been a few people who've tried to do documentaries and it, they get a bit jumpy about it because it doesn't reflect well yeah. on the nation, does it? I mean, it's 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 not a great thing to be known for. But yeah, um, but yeah any pressure on them to um, just change? I mean, it's just. Yeah, it's it's unacceptable, um, but there um, there are other atrocities elsewhere in the world to do with dogs. But um, but this one just does seem, you know, yeah, it's been going on for far too long. And there are there are lots of um, Fleur is is really um, for many people. Fleur was the first dog that people related to. She was like the poster girl for it because you suddenly realise. No, these are these are given the chance. Can they can be really, really lovely dogs, and it, it's 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 just it's unthinkable. But there's also a lot of other people who've been bringing over loads and loads of Romanian dogs because they look really beautiful. But it is actually quite difficult to rehome a dog that's been used to being f completely free. And um, there's there's been a, a sort of a second wave of dogs in this country that haven't worked out as um, when they've been rehomed. It does take exceptional people. I mean, yeah. Wendy and Andrew really are amazing. I mean, that's yeah. the thing. I don't think Fleur in anyone else's hands would still be alive. Yeah. Um, 
And I think that, um, you know, it's just fate, isn't it? I mean, someone to be a, a nurse. Yes, yes. And you needed to be a nurse, really, to be able to get this dog through this. Yeah, and well, I, I was saying that to Dominic when we were researching the scripts. Now, if this wasn't a true story, people wouldn't have made this up. No. And Andrew's story, I don't know if you managed to dig anything out of him because he's, he's very stiff upper lip about what he does. But, he, you know, every now and again, somebody, you know, Wendy says, oh, did you get shot last week or something? And you get, what sort of life do you live? And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if you read bits of the Fleur book where like, he's, he doesn't like flying. I mean, this is a really brave guy. And he hates flying. And that's the reason this all started. He was sitting on a plane trying to persuade himself that he wasn't really hating every minute of flying because he hates flying. And he read a book and he doesn't read many books. And he read the book about um, Nauzad, the guy who rescues yes. the yes. dogs. Yes. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant story. And it, it ticked all his boxes because he was military and he was, and he was a big, tough guy who doesn't, you know, but he's such a softy, isn't he? I mean, he, he, he pretends to be, but he's probably watching this, probably going mad now. But um, I, I dragged him along to something because um, I'm, I'm always getting him into trouble. Um, a really weird thing uh, um, I took Fleur and Andrew to. Um, Channel 4 did some stupid thing where you could pitch your TV ideas. I don't know if you, uh, it was, it's a pro, I don't think it's ever come off. But it was going to be a new TV program on Channel 4 where it was a competition where normal people pitch their own television idea and the winning, winning pitch gets it made into a program. It was some time ago. And I was um, pitching a dog program. There's a surprise. And um, I wanted to show them Fleur because to me, they, you know, the essence of everything doggy is is there and it was alan carr was um <laughs> was the the host um when they were filming it but it didn't go out and um harry hill and a load of other people were um a very noisy sort of jury and you could see the formulaicness of the of the of the of the program you know like in you know, um x factor you, you have all the rubbish ones that they just take the piss out of well that was I think they were hoping that was what we were going to be because we were going to be the dog story. Yeah. But it, they didn't see it coming. When they heard Fleur's story, you could see Alan's face. I mean, he was, he was on the point of tears because he's a doggy. He's, mm. got, um, he's got Irish setters. One of them's called Beverly, which was a bit confusing because that's my name. Um, <laughs> odd name for a dog, odd name for a girl. But um, and um, you could see them all going, oh, this isn't the formula, is it? We can't take the piss out of this now. Because uh, um, Wendy had baked one of her famous um, poo cakes. Have you seen those? Yeah, we've seen, we've seen pictures of those. Oh, well, you need to taste one. one. Um, but because um, we were introducing a product to um, the panel as well, because we were sort of saying that, you know, a dog programme can touch all the bases. You can get the, you know, the huge, big emotional story. And then at the other end, you've got the really silly stories that are just funny. And I was showing this automatic poop scoop that um, Fleur was modelling for us. And um, Alan loved, loved the, the automatic poop scoop because the dog has to wear it over its bottom at all times. And then it encapsulates any poo in a bag. And then that would, we were able to then tell Fleur's story about her tremendous bottom problems because of um, her surgery and her lack of... Um, Yes, and and how important it was to know what type of poo, and then the cake came out and we showed all the Bristol stool chart of all the things, and yeah, Fleur, you could see them going, oh, it doesn't fit in this program, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you could, you want to know more about Fleur, and I was thinking, yeah, Fleur, Fleur would should be a TV program, she, Fleur should be a film, but I'm always on that. But it is actually going to happen. You're going to make the film. So I'm going to be really annoying and ask you questions all the time about how is it, what's, what's, the, what's you know, the opening shots, what's this? Because that's what I did to um, someone who also, who also optioned a, an, a, an idea that I thought should be a film. And we spent ages talking about 
I wanted this film to be like The English Patient. So I've got huge ideas for people's films. I mean, nobody has got the budget to do The English Patient these days. I mean, that's a ridiculously expensive movie. It could all be green screen today. Yeah. <laughs> but, but Fleur is, is going to be um, an epic, epic story. And I, I just, um, I'm really excited that you're going to work on it. Um, so why, why? is it dogs with you guys because you said you mentioned a dog that when you were growing up that you were atta- attached we've always, been, we've always been upset when we were kids we were obsessed with two things animals and film it's, yeah uh, it's, it was always going to be that we were going to make a film about animals and we've got like i said we've got a, a notebook full of stories we want to tell the dogs but also other animals there's uh, elephants you know there's, there's, there's all kinds of stories we want to we want to well i think we <laughs> dogs are i think we've always been more bond, isn't it? yeah i think there's, there's, there's just something we still respect dogs um uh, so again massive it's probably the, the the whole relationship that we have which is so unusual in nature you know yes it seems to have such uh, close friendship yeah, close kind of um it's almost like it mirror each other uh, and uh, we, we sort of we belong together so I think there's it's always something about dogs. It's always it's every stray in the neighbourhood is coming home with us. You know, uh, every, <laughs> even on holiday, in, you know, in Spain, there was a, a a little puppy that we adopted and we wanted to bring home with us. So it's, it took, took us four years of nagging our mom to get a dog. Yeah. Every day, dog, come here, dog, please come in with a dog. But in any end, she just said, "Yeah, okay, no more than that." Yeah. I mean, dogs are they're like a mystery. Even even the word dog, nobody knows yeah. that. There's no roots word in any language for dog. It's it just, I think it's fitting though to have such a mysterious word. Mm. Dogs, you know, it's such a big mystery. You know, why are we so cool to dogs and why are they so cool to us? Well, um, I think I, I interviewed Ian Dunbar a few um, podcasts ago. He was a, a doc, got doctorate in behaviorism and all that. He invented puppy socialization. He was a vet in Britain and went to California. But he, um, he said something that um, dogs, horses, dolphins, and women are the only ones that put up with men being horrible to them and then still come back. And it, it's true. It's weird, isn't it? But we don't really have a, a, a relationship with dolphins because they're in the water. And horses, it's sort of a, a submissive thing, isn't it? Um, the horse is, but it's still possible to have a better relationship with horses than most people do. And Ian was telling me that he, his grandfather had taught the horse that on their farm to plow the field without wearing a bridle. And he won a plowing competition just by telling the horse by command, which and using rewards. And you sort of think, wow, that's a, a, you know, people bully creatures yes. into it. you don't have to and that, and that made him want to become a dog behaviorist because he saw on the farm a way that was different i mean we don't we've lost it now when people lived on the farm and it was all local we treated animals in a different way yes. and now yeah. we've, we've sort of lost that yeah. but there's a, a, a chap that I'd, I'd i'd recommend you to have a look at them um, you may already know of this chap dr rupert sheldrake have you come across this chap he's a, a um he was a biologist now this should be a film this should definitely be a film he he's alive um which is always good um if you're going to do a story um but he was a i think he was at oxford and he was a top scientist um biologist an absolute genius and all of a sudden he had this moment when he was studying where he went no this is all wrong it's all wrong the the science is all wrong but um he suddenly realised that everything was connected and that um, like he felt that when people cut a blade of grass, it hurt the grass. We just couldn't hear it. Yes. We didn't know. And he believed that the trees talked to each other. Now, science has actually caught up now and said, actually, that's true, because one end of a forest will tell the other end of the forest that there's a drought coming and there's, or there's really aggressive insects. So. They haven't got brains, but they're communicating to each other. Yes. So he was right. And he believed that dogs used to talk to us in a different way. And we used to be able to communicate with all the animals and all the dogs. Then we developed language. And we forgot how to, how to communicate. 
but the dog was still reading us. Mm. So they knew what we were thinking, but we weren't able to speak back. Yeah. Um, and that, that's why he wrote a book called Seven Experiments That Changed the World. And it's full of unexplained things like um, why do pigeons, uh, why can they find their way? And why do dogs travel miles and miles to find their owners? Or why do dogs know when people are coming home? Yeah. ahead of time why did they how can they know that and there's also other unexplained things like um he reckoned that it was a collective intelligence and that sheep like if one sheep in wales was to learn that you could roll over a cattle grid that uh, the chances are another sheep in australia would yeah. do the same because there'd be a collective learning and that if one of us does the crossword the next person will find it slightly easier and that we we may be learning. And that's how evolution occurs. Now, he was treated as a complete lunatic, as you can imagine, and thrown out by all the proper scientists. And he, he didn't care. He really didn't care. And he's he still believes all these things really, really, really strongly. And every now and again, there's another breakthrough where everyone goes, oh, he was right about that. Because okay. geniuses are always seen like mad people. Yeah, yeah. but he believes that the animals are talking to us but we just don't know how to listen anymore and it, i think it's a very persuasive view of the world yeah, I, think that, I think there's something in that yeah i, I think um, there are different ways of communicating apart from just using voices that yeah. are very much uh, i think uh, animals are capable of communicating uh, of communicating i mean uh, look at cats but then there's a communication system that goes on within the cat world so i think yeah very interesting um, do, do, do check him out he might be a future yeah. movie because i can i could see that being a, a, a you know I, I think it's always any struggling genius who is treated by all his contemporaries as mad and suffers mm. for what he believes in i mean he is a wonderfully eccentric chap so he's lovely absolute sweetheart but his um one of the things that I think proves what he's saying is um, like the epilepsy alert dogs. <clears throat> they, they can give you a 45 minute warning of a seizure and nobody knows how mm. or why. Um, but it, and it happens spontaneously and now they're trained dogs to do it. Now, there's a, so many levels that that's just really difficult to understand. One of them is, well, maybe cats do that too, but cats aren't going to bother telling us. <laughs> Unless they're hungry. Yeah. <laughs> well, the dog's going, I don't want you to bash your head, so I'm going to tell you to sit down. And and, and there's that care there. Yeah, that... well, uh, talking about that, on our last film, um, which we did, which was about a chap called Blind Dave Healy. Um, ah, yes. He, a, um, he had a uh, um, blind dog, yeah, blind dog, uh, Seamus. And um, he's actually appeared in the film, Seamus, uh, the guest star. But oh. what we didn't know at the time, and what had been going on for a year, was that he had um, stomach cancer. Oh. Uh, nobody knew because he's he was the dog was always there to serve Dave, you know, just to make sure Dave didn't bump into anything, to make sure Dave had what he needed. Mm -hmm. But he just suffered in silence, and this poor dog must have been going through such horrible pain. Nobody knew until he got really sick one day, and they took him to the vets, and the vet said, "I'm sorry, but there's nothing I can do." Just mm -hmm. The dog was so dedicated to looking after Dave that nobody he just hid his own pain. I mean, that is so fascinating. Why do dogs, why do they risk themselves to save us? Yes. They, they, they risk their own lives to save us. I mean, what other animal would do yeah. that? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think it's just, uh, you, can't, you, you can't not marvel at dogs. Yeah. Uh, it, it, the Monday was, was telling us the story. Um, he was breaking down. And Dave's the sort of guy, he doesn't show his emotions. Mm -hmm. Very stoic, um, old fashioned guy. So, you know, he tends to keep it in. But he was breaking up when he was, when he was telling us about um, his drive just past uh, and what Shane's been going through. He, he was welling up. Uh, so it just shows that, like he was saying, he may not have been a, a big animal lover, but he was affected. Yeah. By, uh, just seeing how uh, loyal and, and how strong his dog was yeah. for him, and then he was there for him, and had such an effect on him. It was, it was just so emotional to watch. They, they are amazing because um, dogs seem to, 
yeah, they put up with so much just and are still jolly. I mean, that's the, the thing is they are so inspiring. Um, my One of my old dogs um, had was going through the vet textbook, everything in the world this dog had had. I mean, which is, you know, I had a lot to write about because every illness, I mean, he was ticking them off. This dog had everything wrong with them, with him. Uh, but you couldn't give up because he was just so happy all the time. He went completely blind. Um, he already he had Addison's disease. Addison's disease was a really weird one because Addison's disease, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but the only time I, 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 I had never really heard of it until my dog had it. Um, and I Googled it and JFK had Addison's disease while he was president. Now, how come we didn't know that? Because we know so much about JFK. How did we not know? He got this really serious problem where his adrenal gland didn't work. Now, if today could we have someone who's in charge who given a real shock he could yeah. just keel over and die yeah. um and also um the drugs that you get for addison's can make you highly sexed could this have been one of yeah. the problems he had um also if you get the dose wrong um your skin color changes and he was always being accused of having a fake tan but it was uh, yeah. it, it was his drugs that were wrong and they, they, I've seen it from my, my own dog's perspective that you get the balance wrong and gosh, it can make them very unwell. And the drug that we used on our dog was imported from America and it was the drug that JFK was on because that was the best drug for, for dogs. They moved on for humans, but they kept the dog drug going. Um, but yeah, dogs... You know, yeah, I mean, we get you know something slightly wrong with us, and it impedes our view of the world. But they still just keep going. I mean, they yeah. are, they are. Yeah, we have we have to be brave, and we have to be the ones who call time, which is yeah. extremely hard. Yeah. And in Romania, they've got those dogs and that have the wheels. You know, have got the hind yeah. legs. Well, I don't we're just running around. Yeah, it's happy, know, it's happy, it's happy, you know, as happy as the dogs with four legs. Yeah. You know, I look at that and I think, you know, why can't we be like that? You know. Yeah, yeah, it, it is amazing. You know, there's a, a lady in America who makes um, halos for blind dogs because the, one of the problems with blind ones is that they run about and they bump into things and they'll bash their nose all the time. And some of them will become very fearful because imagine if you were running around and you hit your head, you'd stop running around. So the halo is like a, a big um, hoop and they actually have wings on the back because it's American. <laughs> and um, she donates them to rescues that have got blind dogs that need homes. And, you know, they're much more likely to get a home if they're wearing a halo, aren't they? But the halo actually works. So Muffin's halo, um, if anyone's got a blind dog out there that's bumping into things. I had one, an enormous one, because my dog was huge. And um, no, he, he, he just... He, he, he was so heavy that he would just squash the thing and still bump into things. And he didn't mind. He just, just, yeah, big old fool. But yeah, it is amazing what dogs will, will, will endure. And um, I think Fleur's story is, is, you know, to, is, is just an absolutely without you know, people who know the story know that after surviving the atrocities of Romania and being plucked out of being in a in a kill shelter, brought over to England to the serene, lovely life with Wendy and Andrew. And then, yeah, I mean, it, it is a proper plot movie sort of, you know, you have that Go terribly, yeah. yeah, that the worst possible thing happens where the dog, um, dogs inside start dying and there's no one who knows how to put it right. And then yeah. the word of Facebook, we discover that down the road there are the best surgeons in the world, and but no one has yet done this operation and the dog has lived. It's very faith affirming in humanity because uh, first part of the film we look at the worst of humanity, uh, mm -hmm. what the experiences and cruelty. But it's only by people coming together that she succeeds and she, she has a chance in life because there's a thousand people that help donate towards yeah. her 
five seven but it, so it brings people together so you know for the worst great. of our nations it's in the very best of people yeah. so you, you have got that wonderful arc in the story again which it is really cool to us in, in the story it's perfect isn't it because um I, I i can remember where i was um it's a bit like the jfk thing is it I, I was sitting in my car waiting for my son to come out of school and i got a mobile phone call from um from lovely oh gosh my brain's going dead um the lady who runs the rescue val val, val gosh, yeah. what's the matter with me um and she's going look um they're on the way to the royal veterinary college for this should we do it should we risk it should we try and save i want i want to yeah what do you think people are going to say um and, and i said i think you're right you know if there's a chance let's let the public know and let them decide really you know come on let's make make everyone part of it tell them and everyone was following the, on social media the dog on the way to the veterinary college and they're all cheering her on and um the all the vets came out into the into the car park you probably already visualized this say so we've we hear we've got a very famous patient coming Right. And and you know that was the thing. It was in real time that people were were donating and wanting updates, and we all held our breath for um, for news. And so rarely do you get news that is happy news. Yeah. And yeah. it was yeah. like, and I, I met the vet. Um, we gave Fleur an award, and Fleur and Val and Wendy and. Everyone, uh, with the super vet Noel, so if you can get him in the movie, he wants to be an actor. By the way, he was an actor. Did you know he was before he was the super vet? He was in the Bill. Um, he was in a very bad film, um, but yeah, he had a, a parallel career as an actor. So if you were cast, ask you know, talk to his agent, see if he can be himself in the yeah, movie, giving you. Then you'll get lots of women watching. Just. Well, <laughs> but yeah ask Noel if he'll if he'll if he'll um yeah use his equity card again um yeah so it, we, it was the uh, london pet show Noel was giving the awards out and um in the audience was the vet one of the vets who operated on fleur and it was the first you know she came forward with a, a daughter and you thought wow how amazing for the daughter to to be there when her mum is sort of saying i saved that dog yeah because no no one else had ever made that operation work so right. it, was, it was huge effort and they worked all night on it yeah, there was and, a one percent chance of success in that operation yeah. uh, miracles you can see uh, it's a miracle as long as there are miracles <laughs> and that's the thing there were there were ten thousand people who didn't believe in miracles all wanting a miracle because yeah. On Facebook, you get so many appeals, so many dogs that are in trouble that need your help, and but something about fur uh, yeah. just just made people stop and go, well, let's let's try, let's try, and and look, it, it the dog is living life um, and loving every minute of it. Um, I was hoping that they were going to make a, a, a little appearance, but the wonders of um, technology. I don't know whether is anyone. Oh, hold on. Have we got someone waiting in the waiting room? I don't think we have. If you're watching this, Andrew, try and work out how 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 this works. Or Wendy. I know Wendy's meant to be looking after grandkids at the moment, so she's, she may well be reading stories and doing other important tasks. But, um, yeah, do do let us have a glimpse of, of Fleur if, um, if you can make the technology work. I don't know whether he's watching. The thing is, with there being a 20 second delay on this, in 20 seconds time, you'll probably <laughs> see that and we'll have moved on. <laughs> but anyway, just if you're there, Andrew, press the button and we'll let you in the waiting room. He's probably, he's, he's terribly shy. Have you noticed? He'd, he's like, no, if someone else can do that. And, and he's always push push someone else forward. Absolutely, we I mean, met them. We right? just just chatting for, for hours. Mm. It's probably a very modest. Yeah, I think he's a modest guy, a very modest guy. Uh, which is, it's, you know, it's what I like about Andrea. I think you know, he, he's uh, he's got such a humility to him. He's so down to earth. 
They were both actually both Andrew and Wendy are both yeah. people such you know, so down to earth and you know and so easy to talk to. So yeah, it's no wonder they uh the first blossoming under their care. They are such nice people. Yeah, they are. They're, they're, they're soft touches as well. They they're always taking on cases that um yes, other people would go, yes. oh, that's too difficult. Um, and the more difficult, the more likely they are to say yes. So, um, so therefore, they tend to get asked, yes. <laughs> which is yeah. awful. But um, and the the other things that Andrew is going to hate this. But yeah, you you get on here, Andrew, and then you won't. I won't tell people how nice you are. But do you know that he's a paramedic as well? So that because of the, I'm probably the official secret sense probably stopped me from saying all the things I'm meant to be saying, but um, to tell the story, but. When he's working, um, he has to be able to protect whoever he's looking after because he's, he's in dangerous places protecting people. But if someone was to be shot, he would um, they would be too far away for them to take the person to hospital. So he has to know how to save someone's life. So when he's not working, when he's not overseas working, He's volunteering over here as a, a one of the uh, one of the paramedics that can actually solve anything because in the middle of nowhere, yeah. you have to. So um, that's an incredible partnership there of somebody who's incredibly brave, yeah. who's also very medically, yes, yeah, up yeah. up to yeah. speed. And uh, what a partnership! You know, they, yeah, amazing. But um, well, like we said, you couldn't make it up. Really, I mean, you, you look at the story, you know, the, the true story, and you think this is a script. You know, it's a movie script. It's so uh, incredible. And even the ups and downs of the story. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Great. Why should that happen? Well, if, if they were here now, I would remind them of how we sat in a pub in Shobham saying, it's a book, it's a film. And <clears> they were going, do you think it is? I said, yes, it is. It is. And, um, I'm just so 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 pleased that this is happening quite quickly. I mean, for some people, it takes forever for the story to be, and and I, I, that's what I, I I thought the precedent really is. Street Cat named Bob to an extent. I mean, hopefully your film will be a lot better than that. So. <laughs> but commercially, it made quite a lot of money. I think really, it didn't cost much to make, and it is yeah, the sentiment's fantastic, but the story is so strong, and that's. That was made while the cat was still with us. So yeah. it'd be lovely to see Fleur at her own premiere. Um, can yeah. you imagine? Oh, Ooh, the yeah. red carpet. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, and, and I have Andrew and Wendy asked who, who you're casting as them. I um, mean, that's, um, that's yeah, always we've, interesting. Yeah, we, we, we've got a few ideas. We can't really say anything much at this stage because we, you know, we've... Uh, can I can I hint? Tom Tom Hardy loves doing dog movies. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Tom, Tom, I mean, yeah. we'd love to have Tom Hardy in the film. You yeah. could just make a cameo, you know, you could just walk in the background. Got Tom, Hardy, dog walker, Tom Hardy in the background. Is this an excuse for me to tell you my Tom Hardy story? Can I tell you my Tom Hardy yeah. story? This is my, one of my best stories, and also worst stories. Um I've been editor for 30 years, so you, that's a long time. And many years ago, we used to get this phone call from a young man who kept saying, can you put my dog on the front cover? And the dog was called Max. And I was going, oh, you know, why, why does he keep phoning up? What's his name? His name's Tom. Ah, uh, Wendy's Wendy. It could be Andrew in the morning. I'm going to hold you for a second, um, Andrew and Wendy. Um, I'm going to break because I'm going to finish my Tom Hardy anecdote. I'll be very quick. Um, anyway, in the end, we sent the work experience um, girl to go and interview Tom Hardy um, and take photos, and she took her mum with her. <laughs> and Tom was an absolute sweetheart, and it was the best interview ever. And he told her everything about how. Um, Max had saved his life and changed his life and, and stopped him being a very bad boy. And he, it was a great interview. And she's now a producer at the BBC, the work experience girl. And she was really, she was homeschooled because she'd been bullied. So this was, a, you know, quite a, quite a good little thing. Um, oh, they've gone. 
come back, come back, Wendy. Oh, no. Oh, that's me. They'd probably say, oh, not the Tom Hardy story again. <laughs> but, um, yeah, uh, just, yeah. He, he then was in the magazine several times. Well, a couple of, at least once more, twice more now, I think. And um, there's a person that is in my Facebook friends, um, a producer called Alexandra, Alexandra Bentley. I don't know if you've come across her. Um, but she worked with Tom on um, the one, the, the drug film. Um, or it was yeah, called yeah. The Rescuer. And they yeah. renamed it something awful. That, and so nobody knew that you should go and watch it if you love dogs. Yeah. So, um, yeah. But yeah, but he he absolutely loved the whole thing. Andrew's there now. Sorry, Wendy. Right, Let, let's let them in. Right, any second now. You're live straight away, and I know technology is not not something you like. There we go, Andrew. I can see you. Hi, Andrew. Can you hear us? All right. I can see a bit of Wendy as well. Wendy, get in there. Hello. Hello. Hi, guys. <laughs> Oh, I can only see, can you see uh, Andrew, uh, people on Facebook, can you now see, and can you speak Andrew and Wendy? Uh, I, I, I can speak, yeah, my, my, my lips are moving and words are coming out, I think. Oh, well, we, we can hear you, you could do with a bit more light on you, I have to say, unless you're on purpose, not revealing your identity, because you're... Well, I think you've already done, I think you've done all of that for me. Am I, am I in trouble? Am I in serious trouble? Well, we might be having words afterwards, yeah. Oh, dear. That Which makes a bit too late, because I think I'm out of a job now. I, I, that's it. You're, you, you're no longer... Oh, look at him. He's, he's very angry, isn't he? Oh, dear. I am sorry, Andrew. You know what I'm like. I I'm, I'm just can't be trusted. We tell stories. That's a bit better. We can sort of see... A, I can see a beautiful picture of Fleur. Oh, yeah. Um, but I, uh, uh, on the wall, but not the actual real Fleur. Gosh. Anyway, yeah, we're here, so you've got us. So have you been tuning in? Have you been listening to us talking about you? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so did you remember that day when we were talking about the book and the film all those years ago? Was it years ago? It doesn't seem that long ago. No, no, you're right. No, Beverly, it's, um, it doesn't seem that long ago, but it was. It was years ago. I'm going to say two to three years. Yeah. It was quite a while ago then. But it's taking, it's not, you know, it's moving fairly at a, a pace now, though, isn't it? So um, are, are, are you, has it changed your life? Are you recognised everywhere you go already? There is. Oh, Fleur is. Fleur's yeah. No, absolutely. Fleur's recognised all over the place. Uh, we're not. Well, Wendy might be, but she's got a face for recognition, isn't she? Gorgeous. <laughs> but uh, no, um, so no, Fleur is. We, um, I was out walking once. It went in on proper lockdown. Yeah. One hour a day. Uh, each day. And um, uh, Fleur and I was out. We were doing the morning walk. And um, we passed these people, and oh, in fact, I'll tell you what, it was the 23rd of April because it was Wendy's birthday, oh. and it was, and I was trying to get back. My son was making her a, a, a cream tea, and we'd been given a time mm. when we've got to be back in the house. Bear in mind, don't forget, this is proper lockdown, COVID-19 lockdown, so right. Wendy's a full-time nurse, as you well know, so we needed to make this really special for her. And I had a specific time that I needed to get back, and we were just rounding the corner to get home, and... Um, this person was walking past, I was out on their one hour walk, and they just noticed too late when I walked past them, heard them say to her partner, that, that's blur, that's blur. And I, I was, I, was, I feel so bad, because um, I just breezed past, because I, I, I had to get back to Wendy's like IT or whatever it was called. Yeah. Right? Anyways, I reflected on the day later on, and I realized, I mean, you know, somebody's just, you know, on their one day, or one walk a day they can have, Oh. And they probably really chuffed the bits that they've just met Fleur, and I just breezed past them. I was gutted. Anyway, three or four days, I went out at exactly the same time with Fleur, hoping that they would walk that way again. And luckily, they did. I was able to apologise to them. And no, they were. They knew. They knew Fleur actually um, um, from from Dogs Today, from yeah. reading the story in, in, in Dogs Today. So yeah. And they were, they were actually chuffed bits to me. They weren't interested in seeing me at all. Oh. But they chuffed the bits about seeing Fleur. 
So who do you want to play you two in the movie? Me. Um, yeah. Elma Fudd for me, please. <laughs> She's going to be out of our budget. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Wendy? Who do you, who do you think? Oh, I, I haven't really thought about it. I would like oh. Davina McCall to play uh, Wendy, please, and I'll play myself. <laughs> well, there you go. I'll, that then. I'll have Tom Hanks to play himself. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Hanks, yeah, that would work. That would work. And Davina's not... I don't think Davina's ever done any acting, has she? Uh, Dominic and Ian, Davina McCall has been on our front cover already with her own dog. So... Okay. You may find that that she may want to want to you know if she's going to make the leap into into acting. There we go, Davina, dog mad. That's another name to the list. Yeah, put a, put Davina in there. Um, I'm just trying to think. You could have Tom and his wife. Tom's wife's a fantastic actress and looks a little bit like Wendy. So there you go. I forgot uh, what her name is. That's names to the list. Uh, Andrew, you've been upgraded to uh, Tom Hardy now. There you go. Oh, look, Fleur. Uh, I, maybe if we could see a little bit more of Fleur. There we go. Now, everyone watching, if you've got an acting dog that looks like Fleur, I think it's very unlikely that there's ever a dog as beautiful as Fleur, then, um, you know, send your CV in because these, these guys are casting. So uh, we're looking for an acting dog that could be as beautiful and and have the range that Fleur has because Fleur has got you know moments of sort of yeah. looking into the distance and being you know the wild of the past as is in the eyes and then the next minute the sadness of what's yes. happened yeah. and, and then um what does she do that that is embarrassing that you can just in, in you know she, what's the worst thing she does at home the naughtiest thing does she ever do anything naughty uh. Yeah, well, I mean, you've already mentioned, um, I, I suppose, you know, the most uh, visual naughtiest thing she's ever done is uh, she, still, she still registers on the Bristol stool chart quite quite often. Ooh. And, you know, and, and you know that um, the B12 injections, which are still critical for her, um, they're, they're non-existent. We can't get them. So she's on the tablet form at the moment, and um, which helps, but... But it is, is no substitute for the uh, for, for the um, for the injections. Then let's do a shout out because um, Dogs Today's audience on Facebook is international. Should we ask if there's is there any country in the world still doing vitamin B12 injections for dogs? Is it well, does it have to be for dogs? Can it be for humans as well? No, we, I mean yeah, we, we, we we don't believe. We don't believe that the that the human. I don't know that we're, we're not knowledgeable enough. So you know what we're saying is probably a load of old rubbish. But we've been down that route with the vets and such like, and the, the human version B12, B12 in my head, but that's obviously not the case. Um, mm. It doesn't quite work like that. And this that's telling um, because her facial expression and such like, just the way her genetic makeup of her face. Um, you used to be able to see when she was getting to to the point where she needed her injection she'd have her injection and then her whole demeanor but visually as well you would see a big change in her face and her eyes and the brightness and so on and so forth and I'm, maybe i'm over um, analyzing it now but there's some areas just below along her muzzle um yeah. which would, would lessen a little bit but they're, they're, it, they're puffing up as we went along and she needed it whereas that's always the case with her now we do see maybe she's aging and such like you know she is an old dog now um really how old is fleur well we're going to say you know she's uh, she's over 10. And really? Re yeah really interesting what dominic and ian was saying there early when you were talking about casting her and would she be doing it herself and such so, like so. and those two fellas when we first met them um struck me as uh, as people that, that absolutely care um because we hadn't really you know, yes we we knew and we thought that um, there was a there was a story here, and it told in the right way it would actually made a difference. And um, so I think mean, I think they called us up to to kind of somewhat interview us, but you know we we were interviewing them as well. And yes. um, it, the welfare of her and the welfare of any dog that's going to play Fleur and and all of the other dogs that will probably have to come out in that film as well um, is, is paramount. And they, 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 they those guys care. Um, and that's that's super super important because um, 
I, I've heard you saying on there how strong she is and all of that type of thing. She is, but as strong as she is, she's uh, very sensitive and weak as well. Yeah. Um, and, and and I know that they'll pull that out of the uh, of the story and, and kill. But yeah, she there, there's there's thousands of them, isn't there? There's not just she is one that just so happens to be in the right place, wrong place. But, but found and, and pulled out and, and managed to, to get to where she is now. Unfortunately, she's got, got me at the upper end of the lead, but um, we'll forgive <laughs> it for that. Um, but yeah, um, there's hundreds of thousands like her who, uh, who, are, who are desperate. So these fellas, they'll, they'll tell that story. I, I, I have absolutely no doubt about that. No doubt. No pressure, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, though. That first conversation we had about you wanting to do a film and a book, it wasn't about fame. It wasn't about of um, you know this thing of some people with dogs. It's um, like stage mums and in competitions who push, push, push. The objective was always to help other other dogs in 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 trouble, wasn't it? I mean, I remember you saying that that would. I mean, I, I you know worldwide, you know, the, the becoming billionaires would be nice, but that wasn't your objective. It wasn't fame and fortune. It was to tell the story. The fame and fortune will only get pushed back into um, in, into you know making sure that the, the dogs are all right and and, have, and you know animal welfare to be perfectly honest. Um, so yeah, yeah, good good luck to you. As if um, if you manage to add a few zeros onto the bank balance, it'll only get pushed back into the old uh, animal welfare anyway. So you know everybody's a winner, aren't they? Yeah. No. Uh, um... Oh, it's it's, um, it's exciting, isn't it? Are you th- are you all thrilled about it? The the whole thing. I mean, what a terrible time we're living through, though. I mean, Wendy, uh, what what has it been like for you as a nurse? Oh my god, I'm absolutely exhausted. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I've worked throughout the whole of lockdown, and um, I can only see it because I work in general practice. I can actually there's no light at the end of the tunnel, and there's, you know, we've we've changed the way we're working. And I don't think we'll ever go back to how we worked previously. Mm. And, and it's so hard trying to um, assess somebody over video, telephone, pieces of paper. We're not actually physically seeing people, but um, you have to make some criticism. Uh, but it's scary. It is scary. It's very, yeah. it's very about, yeah. time. So, how have you had to put up with Andrew around the house more as well, or have you been out? Working? No, because I've been out working. Oh right, so you, you, all, all the time, and, and we're actually trying to catch up now. So we're actually working more hours. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm at home a lot of the time with the dogs. Brilliant. Yeah, he's at home. So that that makes it running, running, yeah. Run, run, running, running around with with, with a free house. No, we uh, during the lockdown we had. Um, had uh, my, uh, uh, Grant and, and Kim here as well, so full, full, fully grown adults in this little tiny rabbit hutch. Um, <laughs> but you talk about animal welfare, I mean, there's a bit of human welfare going on, so we pushed into this little sardine can, and uh, and with, with all of the all of the dogs as well. But uh, you just got to do what you do, don't you? You just get each other through. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I, know, I heard your plug going out there about the medic stuff and all of that. And the but yeah, it was it, it was it was tough. When did we down? for a lot of hours um coming home still coming home but then proper proper physically and mentally dry yeah. you know she was taking a real kick and i have to say um my, some of us are designed for that you know we um we go for our whole lives dealing with you know threat and terror and all of that type of thing so you know you just get on with it but i i I'm just astounded by how wonderful, brilliant a lot of human beings have been out there during this time because they've stepped up. They've proper stepped up. It's easy for me, um, done it for, for years and years and years, but no, proper, for, you know, they've really stepped yeah. up. So yeah. a lot of admiration. And, um, and it, you know, the, the, the folks on my screen, now Dominic and Ian are below me, I don't know where they are, where I am with them, whether they're looking up or down. <laughs> but, you know, in in that game as well, you know, since um, you know lockdown twenty second of March, you know, people, you know, the actors and people in film and the, that industry and all those other industry key workers to a degree, been working full time. We're getting a full full wage since it. Yeah, we've been working hard, but we're getting a full wage. A lot of folks out there haven't. Um, it's kind of 
really, really enjoyed. Uh, enjoyed is the right word, but actually maybe uh, maybe really sad as well. The, the um, wolves and, and and men and such like your, your new your new film that came out. So, uh, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. A real. I mean, who am I? I'm a layman in all this stuff. I know nothing about film and stuff like that. But if, if you if you captivate me and get me to, to press play and have a look at something and have a little lump on the throat at the end of the day, you've done a good job. Done a real good job. Well done. Thank you so much. I've, I've put a link um, on uh, if anyone's on Dogs Today Facebook or on my personal Facebook. There's a link to YouTube to so they can watch the the film. Um, it's it's only ten minutes of your life, so it's it's um, yeah, and it's one where you you. And the lovely Peter Egan is doing the voiceover. Um, was he was he a joy to work with? I mean, he's a lovely, uh, lovely man, isn't yeah, he? Such a nice man. Such a such a uh, not how you'd expect it. You know, as such a serious, best he's had you know, decades long career. He's such a, uh, a lovely man to do. So down to earth. So uh, you know, nothing was to describe. He came on board straight away. Really, when we approached him, uh, he, he 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 just. He, I mean, did you hear what he did on Downton Abbey? He, yeah. he made them all vegetarian yes, yes, in the dinner. Yes, um, yes. You know, he, he just—he he never stops. He never stops trying to change people. Um, and well, I think that's, that's, that's he's such a perfect fit because obviously he's an actor with an amazing voice. But the, the fact that he's got this passion for animals, yes. I mean, you couldn't find a better actor for a project. Well, perfect fit. Mm -hmm. When he said yes, we uh, just. When we were writing the script, we, he was the, the number one name we had in mind that we wanted him to do it. Oh. And we had to Nigel uh, producing and said, like, you know, if we can get him, that's, that's the ideal. And Nigel said, uh, leave it to me, I'll get in touch. And you know, next thing uh, he said, yeah, he's on board. Uh, so it was, it was amazing. It's a, it, and it's such a distinctive voice, isn't it? You, you immediately go, oh, it's yeah. you no. Know, and it, he's always um, so so passionate about any campaign um you can always rely on him whereas um you sort of get to know which of the um high profile people really will always yeah. always be behind what's right and and, and he, he is um oh there's been some some things where you know he's just taken grief for no reason at all um because he's he's stuck up for what's right and yeah. i love that about him i think it's it's so nice to have someone who's got the backbone to yeah. say no that's wrong i'm gonna i'm gonna fight and and you know somebody that you know maybe you could try and get ricky gervais a cameo in in it you know just because he's yeah. another one who once he gets his teeth into something like um, I don't know if you watched his um, his Netflix. Is it Netflix? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, where he's fallen in love with that dog, and yeah. he hasn't got a dog, but he, he's just obsessed with the dog. That's <laughs> in yeah. that program. Let him have a dog. I mean, but they've got cats, so they can't have a dog. But um, you know, he's so passionate about dogs. He is, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I I just think you know. There is, it's like the Masons, the dog world. <laughs> I, only, only nice. No, the, the, <laughs> In a good way. Yeah. But dog people will help each other. And, and I, I think that's the thing. If they know that you're doing your best and you're trying to make the world yeah. better for dogs. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's true, isn't it, Andrew? There are good people out there that will, will all behave themselves and pull in the right direction. Absolutely. Agree with you one hundred percent. Don't be Freddie. Indeed. Oh, which uh, is this one? Is this, this is Freddie? This is our new. This is our new. new edition. Is this another failed Foster? Yeah. It's Wendy's. <laughs> Wendy's failed Foster, and it, I think Val. I think Val from Val Gray, She's on here watching as well. She Val. knows. She, she knows. She knows, does. doesn't she? She yeah. sent. She sent him over. Literally, I think it was just going into. It lockdown. was a week after lockdown. She was able to move him because it was a dog ambulance, and she, she sent him over, and he was intact as well. And he, yeah, yeah, big old strong border collie knows how to use his front legs and all of that type of malarkey. He was running around this house, causing absolute havoc. Even, even this poor little one. Oh, this is little Magsy, little Magsy here. Is Magsy all right? Because I know Matt, you had some some frightening times, didn't you, with Magsy? 
Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, she, she's, she's all right now. She's okay. I think there's a cat there. Oh. Oh. oh, I couldn't hear that. What did you say there? I think it was a trapped nerve. Get a trapped was nerve. that what it was? Oh. Yeah, it was a paralyzer for sort of 24 hours. Oh, gosh. Drama. Dear Drama. me. Drama queen. I, I think I saw I saw I saw the beginning of the story and I never saw the end of the story and I, I was always wondering what happened. But now anyone else who saw the beginning of that now knows everything's all right. So that's good. Who's going to play Val in the movie though? That's uh, I could see Cameron Diaz. I think Val. Um, no, we, okay, we've got we've got a couple of ideas. Um, but what was other one? We're thinking the old school. Uh, oh. Yeah, oh, the, that lady who was in Born Free, Virginia, is, that's a bit old for... for, for yeah, yeah, yeah. But she's come she's out of retirement. Well, she's got a hands with uh, the charity work that she does. No, but she I came thought. out of um, retirement to do Nick Knowles' film. With Nick Knowles' gonna, films, not exactly. It can, it can only be Judy Dench. I'm going to think Nigel then. I'm going to think Nigel. He's going to work for the next month. Judy Dench or Helen Mirren. Helen Mirren, would, you know, and does Helen Mirren like dogs? I don't know. I don't know if she does. Hmm. Judy Dench, I I think. Hmm. Does she? Because she was in Cats, the movie, wasn't she? So, oh, yeah. so, mm, so she's always like games, aren't they? So you know, it makes sense. Hmm. Yes. Well, yeah. I can't wait to see who who eventually plays all these yeah. people. Um. Gosh. We've, got a, we've got a hit list and we'll see if we'll see you get back and say yeah. yes. Right. I'm just trying to think if there's any actors on, on my timeline. Um, is there a r- role for Anthony Head? Um, well, we, we, we really, I mean, it's hard to say all the scripts written, you know, how many roles are going to be in there. Because some, some characters may be amalgamations of two or three different people. So mm. it, it really, I mean, all we can really say is we, the, the people we definitely know are going to be in the film. Uh-huh. Um, potential casting, but um, the rest will wait until the scripts. You know. Okay. Um, you know, some final draft. All right. Well, if anyone, if anyone's got any ins to anybody fantastic who uh, would would like to to be part of this without charging an arm and a leg, yeah. Because um, I, I, I presume that it's uh, you, as with all good movies, you want to put it out as as inexpensively as possible, so that. Uh, Yes, it can be um, a huge success because, uh, I mean, how does it work? Do you get a distributor before you start or do you sell it in at some point? How does it work? Uh, it depends again uh, because it's, it's, it's shifting so much the um, whole distribution world. You know, it's, it's radically different today than it was five years ago. So we've got uh, one option is to find a distribution company. Uh, we've, we've had a Potential interest from from one company who um, potentially could come on early on the project, mm. so already in place, which would help the funding. Uh, or we could look towards self distribution and doing it ourselves. So yes. I think it's, it's a, a conversation we want to have once we've got the script done. You know, I think at the moment we're just focusing on getting the right. creation, yeah, getting best script possible because a film, you know, is only as good as the script. So we've got to have yes. a great script in place. I think then it's uh, he had some meeting with the uh, people involved in the film, uh, Andy Andrew um, Finances. It's a, uh, a proper sit down discussion about how we want to move forward with the film. Like, do we go the traditional way of the pros and cons? Yeah, Bruce, or do we look towards doing something a bit more self distribution, which is uh, it's not a viable option at the moment. So I, I guess I think it depends once we've got the script done. Uh, we'll probably be in a better place. Now where we want to go forward. One one of the mad ideas I've had um, repeatedly um, and keep trying to do was to set up a production company that is called well actually it's got name Waiting for Doggo. <laughs> right, nice plan. <point. laughs> and pull together all the people who want to make films, TV, everything to do with dogs, and have like a, a cooperative where we have all these people who who absolutely believe in what they're doing and then don't charge to produce or work on things, uh, but own a percentage of the end result. 
And um, if you if you've struggled to get a distributor or someone to front all the money, um, do do consider this as a, a, a way of finding all the people in the industry that are dog nuts because there are loads of them. Yeah. yeah. Um, and another another weird film anecdote, which I think I used in my Colin Skeeping one. Um, Stanley Kubrick was one of our readers, and really? yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but he wasn't known to be the most um, friendly of people, but he was having problems with his gold retriever. And they phoned up um, the, the the man who was there, like the, I don't know, butler. <laughs> I don't think they had a butler, but the person who you know, did everything phoned up and said, the dogs keep um, knocking the door down in the kitchen because they want to go out. Can you get a dog flap that's big enough for a golden retriever? And, you know, I could see there was obviously a negative there that if the dog could get through it, people could get in because, you know, Golden Retriever is quite a large dog. But yeah. um, we found him one and they were delighted. And we discovered that there were only two publications he subscribed to and it was Dogs Today and Variety. And oh, his, right. his lovely wife sent us a book of um, paintings that she'd done uh, that included um, their dog as well. And you just didn't know that he was a soft <laughs> So, um, no, I know he's a very introverted, very introverted man. He, he hated, he lived in England and he hated leaving England. So all his films tended to be shot in England, even films of a um, full metal jacket, which was set in Vietnam, was filmed yeah. in England. Because he, you know, he was uh, he, uh, he very much reclusive, brilliant filmmaker, and an absolutely brilliant filmmaker, but yeah, very, very private man. Yeah, yeah. but they're out there. I mean, that's the thing. There's people out there that have got a secret dog thing and that they would they want to work with other people who understand and who get it yeah. rather than just um, pretend. Because yeah. you know the movies that, like you mentioned, was it um, the Harrison Ford one, where yeah. it's not quite yeah. right. And we can all see it because we know how a dog should move and how yeah. a dog would interact. Um, Ian, bless him, uh, Ian Dunbar, the chap I mentioned earlier, the behaviourist, he was called in on the animation Up, you know, Up? Yes, yes. And yes. it was him who came up with the squirrel bit, you know, the because um, yeah. he did a, if you get the director's cut of Up, I'm not sure why you would, but you're animators, so you might do. Um, they, they, Ian then did a talk at the end um, of the director's cut to the animators about dog behavior and dog movement and, and how, and I was out of that came the squirrel. And the guy who was the director claimed it was his idea, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it was a- The director's got massive ego, as you see. Yeah, a little monkey. But, um, but that, that was, was it Sam Simon that was involved there? But Sam Simon from The Simpsons was similarly one of those people that was dog, absolutely dog mad. And all the money that he made out of The Simpsons um, he set he set up a dog foundation to yeah. rescue dogs, and and you sort of think, yeah, how come we don't find that out yeah. until yeah. we 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 gradually piece it together that they're they're out there. These people uh, yeah. love love and get it completely. Well, um, Mickey Rourke was filming in Romania. Yeah, uh, he adopted the dog and maybe set up um, a yeah. is that, is that our uh, sort of like a pension isn't it, or something he set up. In Romania, and he said that nobody's to make money out of it. It's fair for the dogs. It's not a money-making operation, which I thought absolutely brilliant. Uh, yeah, and I think that's the thing. Very often, I think the people who are hugely successful and don't really can't trust humans to interact with them like normal people anymore. Um, I really do appreciate the dog loving them just like we had an event years ago where um called the cold wet nose show we we're always doing terrible puns for things but we had a big outdoor event for and we we gave an award to noel fitzpatrick the super vet because you know we can't give him too many awards and um he was chris evans the dj was getting an award of a pet of pet owner of the year because he was always talking about his dog on radio too and we also had a homeless lady who um had um been a victim of domestic violence and she'd walked out age 50 with just the dog and ended up on the streets in cardiff 
And um, we'd got a call from the sheltered accommodation saying they were going to change their rules to let this woman in with her dog because the dog meant the world to her. And because she had made such a huge sacrifice to stay with her dog, she'd rather stay on the street than give her dog up. We gave her an award at the same time as we gave these two millionaire guys um, their award. And they were chatting away um because they all love dogs yeah, the homeless yeah. person and a millionaire totally on the same on you know tuned in because yeah. to them the dog didn't know they were worth anything and chris yeah. chris chris has um, got a, a great story of when he went you know when the, it went wrong for him when um he just he lost everything um when he was at virgin mm. and um he just flipped out really and it, it just everything came crashing down and he rest he got a german shepherd puppy um at that point and he just totally dedicated himself to bringing that puppy up and training it to the highest possible standard and that refocusing um he reckoned turned his life around that spending time with the dog just yes. grounded him again and um I met him when his dog was very, very ill and he was taking his dog to see Noel Fitzpatrick. And that was before Noel was the bionic vet before he was on telly. And nobody, nobody really, only it was a secret that he was a genius. And Chris um, introduced me to Noel, <laughs> which was really surreal because these are not people who like publicity. But he was saying, I want people to know about this guy because he's a miracle worker. And Chris was, he did an interview for Dogs Today. <laughs> Doesn't do interviews, Chris Evans. And then the Daily Mail wanted to use our interview with Chris because he doesn't talk to the press because he doesn't like them. Um, but he said it was all right as long as his friend Noel got a mention. And now Noel is like yeah. probably more famous than Chris. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but Chris is probably delighted about that. But they, yeah. they, that's the thing is it's like, it is like the Mengsons. They'll all help each other. If they look into someone's eyes and know that what they want is, you know, is pure. Yeah, it's pure. It's yeah. the advancement of the dog. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's the thing. That you Hopefully you now are speaking to a really diverse group of people who are yeah. all doggy all around the world a percentage of them could make your movie happen yeah um some of them are very very wealthy maybe mm -hmm. they want to make just like you had your your backer that did the 13th, 13th day, day yeah. there's someone out there who wants to make a movie yeah. that changes people's perception about yeah. dogs and the way yeah. we treat vulnerable elements of society yeah i mean so, isn't a film just uh, you know, a cute movie about a dog. We don't want to make that. We want to make a film that explores what it is that's special about a dog. You know, and it's not fluffy, cute, uh, you know, kind of schmaltzy Hollywood Disney type thing. Oh, Disney type thing. You, you know, we want something that's half out. It's time to really move. If we can move somebody who doesn't really understand what it is about dogs that we love, then we, we've made a successful movie. Mm -hmm. Wow. So the Fleur movie, Andrew and Wendy, what you did, hopefully, will change a generation. You never know. I mean, yeah. if enough people see it, and that's the thing, the more backing you can get, the bigger your budget, the bigger the stars, the more likely. I, I, I'm going to give a name check to Alex, Alexandra. Alexandra. Ah. I really, I, I need to either drink more or less. I'm not very good with names today. Um, but um, I'll tell you how I met this lady. And if she's listening, I'm mentioning you. And um, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, when I did my film school thing, um, it was all full of how difficult it is to write scripts and how you never, ever succeed. And that you, you're just going to break your heart, basically. You're going to write things and you'll never even get read. I mean, it's just, you know... There's, the odds are stacked against you. And um, I knew what I wanted to do for my film. And I'd, it's a true story. And this is not a pitch. I'm not pitching to you. This is, you don't have to make it. But um, it was the story of how, um, well, Dogs Today, how it was saved. 
because it, it died. Um, it was started by the, one of the richest men in the world, um, a media magnate, uh, Viscount Roldemir, who owned the Daily Mail. And I was the launch editor and it failed. And it lost to fortune and it was closed. And I bought it for a pound and he became my minor investor. So the girl from Liverpool ended up with Viscount Rothermere as a shareholder. Um, and he didn't think I could do it. And he just thought it was amusing because he loved his dog. He had a Japanese Akita. And he couldn't trust anybody because he was so powerful and so rich and people just always wanted something out of him. The dog loved him just yeah. for who he was. Yeah. And we, because I'm from Liverpool, I didn't understand that you meant to, you know, bow and scrape to lords and viscounts and things. I didn't know how you do that. I just talked to him as if he was a dog owner and I contradicted him when he was wrong, which again, nobody ever did. And um, he thought that was very funny. So he let me have a go. And, you know, 30 years later, we're still, we're still going. And it was the thing that made him the happiest because his idea worked. And he did all sorts of things behind the scenes because he really wasn't like the Daily Mail. He didn't do all the bad things that the Daily Mail was all about. He he loved women. He loved um, he loved Europe. Uh, he didn't like sh hunting and shooting and all that sort of nonsense. He didn't own property. He was, you know, he, in the war, he was the only title person that ever went in as a private. He, he didn't feel like he was one of them. He, he liked to be with the real people. But that was very odd because he was born into it. Um, anyway, so when I'd write about something in a magazine, like the Dangerous Dogs Act and how unfair it was and how it had, it was racism, really. It was saying that you judge a dog by the way it looks, not by the way it behaves. It made him really angry. So um, he um, invited the Home Secretary round for dinner and then locked him in a room. <laughs> And made him read dogs today <laughs> i thought that's just fantastic isn't it you know what brilliant thing and then um he got annoyed about quarantine he wanted that changed so um he asked the leaders of all the parties whether or not they would um if the daily mail backed them whether or not they'd change to get rid of quarantine and and bring in pet passports john major wouldn't talk um tony blair said yeah yeah i could do that and the Daily Mail backed Tony Blair, um, which wasn't terribly popular with the editor, who really didn't like being told what to do by the proprietor. But the Daily Mail backed Tony Blair and Tony Blair paid back. And we got pet passports. And Lord Rothermere took up his, his seat in the House of Lords uh, as part of the deal, as a Labour peer, which is just ridiculous, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that was the only time he ever used his power, was for dog, not for personal gain yeah. and he did lots of other things and he was just an amazing guy but most people think he was you know well he didn't know what he was like but mm. if you talk about dogs he was lovely and that's the thing is that yes. people yeah. are like that anyway i so the, my story was you know girl who nobody believed in and was rubbish at school ends up you know i don't know little sorts of the the guy who was in who was teaching us went that's really good. It'll get that'll get made. It'll break your heart because someone will take your idea and they'll just ruin it and they won't do it properly. And I said, no, but I want to do it. And they went. He said, yeah. Nobody ever gets their first script ever made into a film. And you know. And then he started looking into it. So yeah, there's the odd person who has that. That lady who did a room. Was it room? That was her first go. Um, the, 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 the hostage one. I can't remember what it was. That's not very good, is it? I should be able to remember the only person who ever got their first script ever made into a film. Um, but um, at the end of it, we had to pitch to a producer who came in and she went round the room asking people what their ideas was and she'd go, maybe Hallmark Channel to people. And, you know, you could see them broken, you know. <laughs> and it went all the way around. I was the last person and I said what my idea was and I had a photo of my dog um, and she said, can we go out for lunch? <laughs> I want to make your film. <laughs> and everyone's sitting around going, how did that happen? That's so annoying. I haven't actually got around to writing the script, but she is my Facebook friend and um, bless her. She is a lovely, lovely lady. And she was the one who did the Tom Hardy one. And, and 
<sighs> she's really, but, really brilliant. Yeah. She's probably watching now. So um, she always wanted to make a dog film. She never made one. So um, I think maybe, maybe if Alexandra's watching, these guys have got a really good idea. But she can yeah. help you um, on the where to place it because she used to work for um she was the one who would buy in things um she was like the, the person who'd made the decisions at over in the states at warner brothers and things. i don't know if you, if you google it you'll see but she um went the other way and then became uh wanted to have control and make her own stuff and every movie she's made has made more money but she can she knows everybody to place things so alexander if you're watching these guys uh, singing from the same hymn sheet. They want to make dog movies that change the world. Because right. that's the thing. They're, they're, it's a niche, uh, making movies that make people happy. Yeah. And make people feel better about the world. And yeah. um, I think we need more of them. So there we go. That's my little pitch to anybody watching. You should do a Kickstarter. And get yeah, we, have, we, have, we have thought about that. Um, doing the crowdfunding uh, campaign, essentially is a way of funding it. So I think it's one option we're... Going to Even if it's only for part of it, um, that's the thing. Because then you can show how much people want that movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because people are always surprised how successful animal true stories are. They're always absolutely surprise bestseller or surprise, you know, box office success. They don't learn that actually it's not a surprise. People like them, and they will watch yeah. them again and again and yeah. again and again. Yeah. But that, that's another pitch um, of an idea. We wanted to launch our own channel that is just, just for yeah, dogs or cats. And, um, well, content, not for them as the audience. There's already a YouTube channel for dogs. But um, a, a satellite channel like Dave, only it was going to be called Betty because my dog's called Betty. And it was reruns of good programmes that are anything to do with dogs and cats. And then at nine o'clock every evening... A, a movie that will send you to bed happy. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's got an animal in it. Yeah. Now I think just like people watch <laughs> reruns of Dave, people would seek out the Animal ch Channel, not because we, you know, Animal Geographic, yeah, yeah. But no, actual proper content with dogs and cats in it. Why hasn't why hasn't it happened? It's yeah. still happened. Yeah. You'll have an audience. You yeah. definitely have an audience for that. Definitely. I mean, it's it's proven that, you know, and we will watch these things again and again and again, especially if we're stressed. Um, yeah. I think British Airways have a whole channel for people flying that is just live action of cats and puppies playing. <laughs> for some people, that just, you know, they can yeah, get out. Yeah. They can, yeah, happy, happy. So there you go. Sorry, I've turned this into a, a pitch, haven't I, for, <laughs> for mad investors to... Uh, but you know they've got to be out there, haven't they? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. These things can be funded. Yeah. I'm just thinking, you know, why not? Why not? Yeah. I think um, we're spending more time watching what we want. Let's get someone making the the content. Oh, content, yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah. Hmm. There you go. Right. Uh, uh, are, you, are you still awake, Andrew and Wendy? Sorry, I, I went off on a tangent <laughs> there. Yet another tangent. Not Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you are you you are awake aren't you yeah yeah, yeah, yeah we're here we're here we're, 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 you're still there you're still back there. and listening to what you've got to say yeah very good right. okay so very, very interested to hear about the um the british airways or other um airlines as well that produce the videos with little puppies playing and such like maybe that would get me abroad again who knows yeah, I mentioned that you don't like flying. Yeah, you did. I thought that was a little bit of a tenuous link there for you back there. <laughs> just nice just, that, to that, that was me just sending you a little message that I have heard everything you said about me. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. I'm going to have to replay that. And if, if you need anything vetoed for, I don't know, the Official Secrets Act, let me know in the edit so that I don't get us all into trouble. I, I think on the think the fact that you the little red thing that says live um, <laughs> has kind of screwed that really, Beverly. Oh, but but when 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 we press the end of this, I I, I 
Dominic and Ian will know what I'm talking about here. I will take this download and uh, edit it on Premiere Pro. Is that you? Yeah, are really impressed now, aren't you? Um, uh, they only actually put titles on it, and I don't actually edit any of it because. I just think people will want to see it live, won't they? Um, yeah. Sometimes I'll put photos in. I might put some pictures of Fleur in because, uh, you know, we want to keep people watching. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, uh, put some powder on the top of my head as well because I think there's a bit of a glow on there. Oh, well, I, 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 my hair's a mess. I mean, that's the thing. What, you know, standards. It's just not... Ah, <sighs> oh, dear. And uh, uh, my um, my green screen behind me is oh you're probably really horrified aren't you guys because you you know how to use a green screen I've got a really naff one that is attached to my chair there we go I, <laughs> I thought it was just a spotlight that was probably your own yeah no but there you go but no it, 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 it's it's been a pleasure to talk to you all and we've made the two hour mark again. You know, no one else does video podcasts <laughs> two hours live, do they? I mean, oh, dear me. The people who are, are still watching, um, well, if you've missed any bits, because you might have had to have a loo break in this um, two-hour marathon um, binge watch, um, it will be on the Devil Wears Dog Hair podcast um, soon. Oh, I don't know why. My, suddenly my screen has gone... I think I'm getting I'm getting hacked at the same time. This is really <laughs> interesting. Yeah, I'm live on air, and someone's trying yeah. to grab hold of my my yeah. um my Facebook page. Oh well, I'm very excited. That must mean we're very successful if if we're being hacked while we're talking. I think Zoom is known for that, though, isn't it? So uh, yeah. Anyway, I think before I mean it could be this. It could be the MI6 or something, Andrew. I probably got in trouble. I'm probably being shut down. Yes. Oh, Fleur's, Fleur's, yeah. Good distraction, Fleur. Just eat something and um, it'll make it look like I didn't do anything wrong. Right, well, thank you so much, Dominic and Ian. And, and uh, it's been lovely to meet you. And it's weird that we've met each other only for the first time in this Zoom <coughs> environment. Um, but I feel like I already know you and you probably already know me to avoid me in future. <laughs> 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 no, dog people are going to stick together. Yeah, wow. Well, let's, let's, let's hope. And, and you never know, you might want to make my film eventually. Um, yeah. If Because Alexander has probably completely given up on me because I am useless at getting anything done. And Andrew and Wendy, thank you so much for letting yeah. letting me part, be part of the Fleur experience. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying every minute of this. And uh, I'm hoping I get an inv invite to the premiere. Well, you're, you're welcome to go on set when we're filming. We're Ooh. invited to come and have a look around. Uh, and also, set. you know, thanks for covering the Fleur story in the first place. Mm -hmm. Thanks for making her the poster dog. Because uh, we, we, we wouldn't even know about Fleur if it wasn't for your magazine. So thanks for yeah. the work that you've done. Aww. Well, a I, I shout out to Rosie and Kevin, who did the uh, front cover and the wonderful Rob King who took the photo of Fleur that's on the front cover because wasn't it the wasn't cover it really staring out at you uh, uh, from Amazon yes. that, yeah. that, that, that drew you to it grabbed so. us yeah, yeah. so yeah everyone's fun. little bit of magic um helped you find because um, if, if, if it had a really naff front cover you probably wouldn't have noticed it would you no. well I, I think we would have read just for research because we were reading anything we could mm -hmm on the situation over in Romania. Uh, so we, we would have probably, but it was the, there's a book cover that we bought in Paul Spire. We thought she's the star. You now she looks like, you know, last and you've got that kind of, you can see her as a movie star. So yeah, Aww. we can see her on the screen. The, um, I hope you might don't mind me jumping in there, Beverly, but I think that's a huge, huge point now. Um, it's a moment in time, isn't it? That photograph, because mm -hmm. go back, that was that was one photograph taken by a lady in a kill shelter in Romania, yeah. which got posted on social media, which eventually spun around the world. And on the twenty something of October, whenever it was, Mrs. Uh, Morris here like nudged me in the back, sat on the sofa just to my right ear, and said, "We're rescuing this dog. We're saving this dog." 
and that was that photograph and it makes me think about that young girl i think the um in national geographic the, the, the blue eyed green eyed girl from yeah. from yeah. i think uh, and uh, from afghanistan um which is now a, a postcard it's a, well certainly in afghanistan it's a famous postcard <laughs> and um that's, that's Fleur kicking off there and uh, it's all, 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 all caught in one photograph Hey, iconic, iconic, and that's. And you asked, uh, you asked about twenty minutes ago about some of the things that Fleur does in the house and stuff like that. Anybody out there listening to live? An athlete, Fleur's a dog. She's a real dog. She does that. She barks and stuff. You know, she's an all singing, all dancing proper dog. Brilliant. Brilliant. She's from a bit of a diva. Yeah, yeah. Was. We'll never know what it was she said, but there'll be people all around the world that do will have dogs that have answered that. <laughs> um, we've had a, a conversation across the world. By the dog next door barking, yeah, that's what started her off. So, yeah, uh -huh. you know, yeah. And we all know that's how say, it's been 101 Dalmatians, wasn't it? They had, they had the old bark <laughs> on oh. going on. It's true, and that's the thing, yeah. Her voice has now been heard on every continent. It's... Uh, no, because it always amazes me. Dogs Today's Facebook is astonishing. If we post a lost dog, we'll get people reposting it, you know, in Texas or, or in India. And you're going, I don't think it's going to go that far. No. <laughs> <laughs> but they all think that we're there um, because the that, that's the thing is we never expected the Facebook page to be international because the magazine is mainly English. Yeah. But well, it's, it's, yeah, it's got some Scottish readers as well. We always get told off because the English laws are the ones that we're always campaigning for. and We, we don't try as hard in Scotland as we should. But, um, but on Facebook, it just, it just went... I don't know if you've seen how many people follow Dogs Today's Facebook page, but... One there's, point, a lot. there's a lot. 1.3 million, which is bigger than Radio 2. And you sort of go... That's crazy. But yeah. what tends to happen is if we say like dogs in weddings, dogs at weddings, we thought, oh, yeah, that's just us. that are nuts, aren't they? You know, that we get all our dogs dressed up for weddings. And then we end up with pictures from all around the world and everybody's doing it. We're all the same. Yeah. And, and it's how similar we all are. Yeah. Um, no matter what country we're in, we're all just dog nuts. Yeah. And we, we, we just don't realise that we think we're the most – the biggest dog lovers mm. no yeah, i mean yeah. germany are just passing a law where you know you have to take your dog for a walk twice a day in the middle of a pandemic they managed to pass that law it's just crazy isn't it really i mean we're still less than we're only six months for animal cruelty yeah. and we still think we're the nation of animal lovers our yeah. legislation is miles out of date sorry yeah. isn't it? I'm, on, I'm on my soapbox again but it, it is true that you know, the rest, your market for this film is international because, yeah, I mean, you, you look how many countries Marley and me um, succeeded in and how many um, languages it was translated into. It, it's a universal language. The, the language yeah. of dog is, yeah. we're all, we're all, if we've, if we've looked into a dog's eyes and, and yeah. gone, because our brains turn to mush immediately, don't they, when we do yeah. that. Um, and that, it's international we're all we're all like that so uh, so thank you so much i'm going to let you all go because um otherwise it, this really will be the longest one ever so wow wow and will you come back on and tell us when you you, you get near a filming because we want to know all the secrets we want to know you know who's who's going to be andrew and who's going to be wendy and who's going to be fleur i mean the casting of the of yeah. fleur Wow. Did you hear my casting then? My northern casting? Yeah. Yeah. On that one. But yeah, we yeah, maybe we can have a, a, a call a casting call through dogs today for um yeah. flare lookalikes. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Be fantastic. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Yeah. So let's yeah, stay in touch. You won't get rid of me now, boys. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the devil wears dog hair and it will shortly be on apple and the other other providers not all of them though do video which is you know, a bit backward isn't it really you think all of the all the all the people doing um what are they called 
podcasts. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I've only learned how to do this um, since lockdown. So, yeah, it's this is all new technology for me. It's amazing that I can actually press the buttons and make it work. Sometimes yeah. it doesn't work, but it, I think it's worked tonight. So hopefully yeah. we recorded it. Right. Well, off to bed, everybody. And uh, I'll, go, I'll go and get told off for spending too long doing this as usual. And um, everyone's going to be really grumpy with me in the house. That's but, that's uh, I really enjoyed it. My two best things, dogs and film. Um, I, I'm, yeah, I'm a fan. So there we go. I haven't watched your, your movie that you let me have a link to yet. I'm going to look forward to watching that. The, the one about the blind. Yeah, the blind you will see Seamus in that, which is Dave's dog. Uh, oh. a small cameo in the role, uh, playing himself. So, yeah, he's, um, uh, it's a bittersweet uh, experience to watch it because you know, it's only a few months after that that he passed away. So. Oh, right. Well, now I know that. I shall watch it with a, with a bit of a sniffle. <laughs> is, that blind, is that Blind Dave Healy? Field? Blind yeah. Dave, yeah. That's, a, that's right. awesome. Thanks, guys. Right. I'm going to watch it tonight instead of Lucifer. I'm getting a bit bored with Lucifer. I don't know. Does anyone else watch Lucifer? No, no. I'm too busy watching the script. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. We were going to find something to watch before you go to bed. But it's, it's Lucifer, yeah. And he's the devil. We want to watch something uplifting and jolly. Isn't he like a Mills Boonesy sort of devil? Yeah, he's he's not really a bad man. He's not a Damien Thorne, is he? He's not exactly like the, the omen. No, but... Somebody pointed out that he's got a touch of um, Julian Clary about it. <laughs> <laughs> now, Julian would be good for the film if you want to. Yeah, he's been on our front cover as well, Julian. I'm name dropping again. There you go. Julian Clary loves his dogs. Um, but yeah, not really known as an actor, is he? No. no I'm no, going to have to think about it. actors that we know are doggy. We must get Bernard involved in this. I've got this oh, a lovely chap called Bernard who does our celebrity interviews. And Bernard, um, it, well, he, it, I don't know whether he's, he's been, he would be watching, um, is not a young man, is Bernard, but his black book is extraordinary. He's had Lionel Richie in the last issue, I think, or is it the next one? And who's the other people he's just had? Uh, Michelle Obama, um, Barbara Streisland. I thought at first he was just like copying things out of press releases. And I, we were just running these stories. I think, oh, that's nice. That's nice. You know, Barbara Streisand loves her dogs. That's lovely. Oh, look, she's cloned them. I didn't know. He got the scoop on that. Ended up in the Times a few weeks later. Right. I think you actually spoke to Barbara Streisand. Yeah, yeah, I know her. Yeah. That's, how do you know all these people? It's because he's, he's lived such a, a long life as... And, you know, he knows all the people who've got dogs and they're all hidden. Um, what was the one he did the other... Oh, yeah, we got people phoning in saying that this was, a, a, you know, that we, we we were wrong. There was an article on um, the Poldark guy. Who's the Poldark guy? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I can't remember his name, but I know... Aiden. Aiden Turner? Is it Aiden? The, yeah, the very good-looking chap who yeah, takes his shirt off all the time. Well, he'd written a, a piece about um, Aiden, and so Aiden was saying how much she enjoys taking his girlfriend's dog for a walk. And this woman kept phoning up saying, "Yeah, how old is this story? And, you know, he hasn't got a girlfriend." And we're going, um, "Bernard, Bernard, are you, are you sure about this story?" And then it turned out that was the first time Aiden had admitted to having this girlfriend. Wow, that's cute. Yeah, so Bernard, um, he knows he knows people. So if you're watching Bernard, see who's you know acting wise, who we can. Yeah, maybe you should text me who's on your wish list, and we'll see whether or not any of them are Bernard's mates. Because <laughs> Bernard Bernard delivers. He's very good. he's got Gary Lineker next week, which I I thought that was that's quite sort of well. And uh, then again, ah, he's, he's football. Yeah, he knows a lot about football. He did the Alex Ferguson um, uh, biography. Bernard did the book, the Flair book. He's the publisher. So be nice to Bernard. And yeah, um, yeah Bernard, yeah, no, talk to Bernard because uh, he'd be very excited you're making a movie because he published the book the, the flower book i'd forgotten about that now everything's very circular there isn't it because yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. bernard, bernard um because I, I was being annoying and going we need someone to, to publish the book about Fleur, and he goes oh 
I'll do it. And that's how the flare book came. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, well. yeah, he's a good guy. Well, I think it's probably past my bedtime because I'm not making sense now. Right. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Thank, Take you, care. Care. Thank, you, and thank you, everyone on Facebook. And off we go. And, and thank you for your time, everyone. And looking forward thank to the you. And everyone, watch your 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 new premiere. And yeah. the link is on our page. So go and have a look. Right, right. Good night, everyone. Okay, okay guys. Blur. That's Blur. Right, guys. Bye. 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 And thank you for joining us, and Wendy, and Fleur, and, and all the other doggies. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.